After the uh, Tuesday, April 10th meeting of the Dinah Park and Recreations Commission. Uh, Janet, could you uh, do a roll call for us, please? Yep. Commissioner McCormick? Here. Commissioner Darlene? Here. Commissioner Good? Here. Commissioner Itis? Here. Commissioner Strother? Here. Commissioner Nelson? Here. Commissioner Shepherd? Here. Commissioner Keeley? Here. Thank you. First item on our agenda is approval of meeting agenda. Could I have a motion for our meeting agenda tonight? Okay, we have one small change that we'll handle. I don't think it's something we necessarily need to note in here, but uh, I will verbally at least. We're gonna give Tom Swenson a couple of minutes to introduce himself uh, in, his, in his new role. So now that we have a meeting agenda moved and seconded, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None, passes. Second is approval of our meeting minutes from uh, March 13th, 2018. Could I have a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second and a second? Second. Any changes on our meeting minutes from last month? No comments, inputs, everything looked in order? Okay, it's been uh, moved and seconded. Uh, can we get a vote to approve our minutes from March 13th, 2018? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passed. All right, first up, Tom, we're gonna give you a couple minutes to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you're excited about maybe in your new role and just welcome you to the, uh, not necessarily to the team because you've already been on it, but to the new position. Thank you. Yep. So I uh, worked for Edina in the uh, Raymar Golf Course for eight years and then another 15 years as a golf course superintendent. Uh, my background in school was electrical engineering uh, with a math minor and another couple of years to get a turf grass certificate uh, from Penn State uh, to pursue my passion of uh, parks maintenance. Uh, I've, uh, I grew up in Edina. Uh, I'm a lifelong uh, Edina resident. I've got kids that have uh, been in the park system. I just realized Matt coached my son his first year of, Matt, of mites for hockey. So uh, I, I know the system. I'm excited to be uh, involved in the, continue to be involved in the park system. Uh, at Braemar, we've done a lot of large projects, uh, and now Ann is leading the charge on a bunch of large projects uh, through the rest of the park system. So I'm hoping my previous skill set will cross over and help uh, the residents and the parks director move forward with the rest of the parks. Here's my one minute introduction. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is a community comment. Any community comments this evening? Yes, sir, please come up, state your name and address. Good evening, good to be here. My name is Jeff Workinger. I live at 5224 Kellogg Avenue. Nice to be here. I wanna make a short comment this evening about Arden Park Project. Um, what's really important to me about the completion of the project is that it's done with sensitivity. Uh, I believe in all the goals of the project to return the creek to its natural course through the park and to improve the park amenities for residents and to improve the capacity to handle uh, water runoff for our streets to reduce the possibility of area local flooding and, and so we won't have to enlarge the big conduit pipes that are, go through Richfield sooner. Maybe we'll be able to absorb more of the water in the park system itself. But there is one goal that's important to me, and that's why I'm gonna take a minute of your time this evening, no more. And that is that as we, as we constantly improve our great community, we find a need to do many, many things, and the Arden Park Project represents a lot of those. It seems to me that it's very important for us to focus on improving the natural beauty or at least maintaining it for this important piece of land. The reason why I wanna make these comments is that every time you go in and you do major work on a park, you risk a result that perhaps you didn't intend to get. And I want to remind you of the importance and the value of having 
that beautiful piece of land that we have there now, it's gorgeous. It's got a lot of, um, a lot of attributes. Um, but so the important message I want to leave with you tonight is that the design and the execution of the project is what is critical as we go forward with this, with this opportunity. And I think that we should, <clears throat> excuse me, keep in mind that as we work with this project, not only the Park Commission, but the Park Department and the City Council and everyone who's involved in moving this ahead and making it successful, is that we need to take tremendous care so that when the project is finished and people walk by that park or use the park, they will, they will see that uh, the project was done with sensitivity and that it reflects that. And what do I mean? I mean, let's not try to scar any more land than we have to. Obviously, we need to do lots of digging and tree removal, and I know that's on your agenda later tonight. Um, and then we're gonna have a new channel through the park, and, and they'll be bringing in caterpillar tractors, and they'll be carving out a meandering process to permit the flow of the creek to uh, flow through the park without tearing the park apart and gradually reduce its elevation so that it, as it no longer goes over the dam, reaches the water level and gets under the bridge at 54th Street. Um, another thing that could happen is that uh, as we, I forget what this is called, uh, but rocks are placed along the banks of creeks and often uh, rocks are put in there as though they were meant to be a work of art if they could, instead of be put in a straight line, could be staggered a bit or, or built in a way that they didn't all look like they were, they were the same size, or it, so it looked more natural is what I'm trying to say. Um, so uh, that's my only message to you tonight. I just wanted to pass it along so we don't lose sight of that. I know that Ann and her team are busy pulling all this together so that the community view will be available in early May, first view of that, that design. So thank you for the opportunity. Good. Thank you, for, uh, <clears throat> thank you for your passion about it and coming to share it with us tonight. We appreciate it. Okay, next up on our agenda, reports and recommendations. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go right ahead. I should have asked again if there was more. My apologies. Uh, my name is Frank Lorenz, 7151 York Avenue South. Uh, my comments uh, pertain to uh, ash uh, borer affected trees generally uh, in the parks, but I see that Arden Park ash trees are on the agenda. Does that preclude me from talking about ash borer problem in a general way? Are you talking about generally across areas of Edina? Edina, the entire sure. city and parks, rather than uh, Arden Park specifically. Yeah, as, as long as you would keep it briefly to that and not right. go into what we're picking up on Arden Park later on. Right. Uh, if you cut down an infected ash tree or if you make a decision that they all will be infected eventually and therefore it's hopeless that if you're going to go into an area you might as well take all the ash trees in the interest of the economy of the sawyers or the constructing company, whatever. Uh, there is a firm in uh, South Minneapolis called Woods from the Hood. They are a company that takes trees that have been cut down in the metro area and they make them into dimensional lumber or furniture or almost anything. I have no idea what they would pay for uh, a board foot of tree trunk, but I think you should at least, if you're going to be doing major cut down of ash trees, consider them as a possible way to recoup some of your money. Now again, they aren't going to take small limbs, 
So whoever you hire, whatever company you hire to cut down the trees can't deliver uh, a full tree in a large truck to these people. It has to be a trunk of a certain minimum <clears throat> diameter. But rather than sending them uh, uh, the, the trees to be chipped and buried, which is what the Minneapolis Park Board says they're going to do, you should at least contact this firm, Woods from the Hood, and see what their requirements are and what they would pay for usable lumber. Uh, the, um, the second possibility is to contact a firm somewhere in the metro area that provides fireplace logs and uh, see if they would have an interest in uh, using the wood that you have to cut down. I believe it's now a state law that you, if you have an infected ash tree, you can't ship wood from that out of the county in which you cut it. So that would be a constraint, but you're in Hennepin County. Hennepin is a big county. There's lots of fireplaces. The negative for this second alternative idea is that if you burn, if you people then burn the firewood, they're releasing the carbon back into the atmosphere, uh, as opposed to if you can make that tree into something useful and permanent, furniture, two by fours, then the carbon is contained and it doesn't go back into the atmosphere. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lorenz. Any other comments tonight for community comments? Nothing. All right, thank you. So reports and recommendations. First up for us is a report on the memory garden renovation design. And Tony, is that am yeah, I correct? I, You're going to Yeah, I think I was going to do just a quick introduction. OK, um, thank you, Susan. Yeah, the Edina Garden Council has been planning for the redesign of the memory garden at Arneson Acres for several years now. Um, the, the council has been actively fundraising to finance the project. The project will be completed in different phases as money is raised. Um, the anticipated cost for the entire project is about $60,000. The cost for phase one is $25,000, which has already been donated to the city. Um, as soon as the snow stops coming down, uh, we'll hopefully be able to get started. Uh, city staff has been involved in the project and the design um, throughout. Tony Siebenhaller Ransom from Studio Suke is going to provide a brief presentation tonight on the process and provide some information to the Parks and Recreation Commission on the overall design. Um, but I think there are several members of the Garden Council that are here tonight, and two members who are, have been instrumental in this um, would like to say a few words, Liz Genovese and Karen Platt. Thank you, Susan. Hi, I'm Karen Platt, and this is Liz Genovese. And as Susan said, we're the co-chairs for the Memory Garden Committee, and we're both members of a garden club of Edina Garden Council. The five garden clubs comprising the Edina Garden Council are passionate about Honors and Acres Park. Through monies raised from our yearly plant sale, we have been able to support a number of projects at Honors and Acres. In addition, we contribute over $2,000 yearly for horticultural scholarships. This year, the plant sale is May 11th to 12th at Arneson Acres Park. Thank you. Okay. The Memory Garden is an area dedicated in the late 1990s, and it has been a special place in Arneson Acres for remembering and honoring former members. The past few years, we realized the original plantings and spaces really needed some renovation and renewal. So the Edina Garden Council uh, formed a memory garden committee, and all five of the clubs are represented on the committee. The committee at first thought we would be able to do the project ourselves, but as we reviewed our desires for the area, we realized that we needed a professional design. So here's Liz. After interviewing several professionals, the council decided to hire Tony Siebenhaller Ransom of Suki Studio and Ben Erickson of BE Landscape Design. Members chose from four different design possibilities for the renovation. The committee was sensitive to members' suggestions and to the relationship of this garden to the park as a whole. 
This garden has been renamed from Memory Garden to the Tranquility Garden through suggestions from members and by a final vote from all the members. Edina Garden Council sees this quiet sanctuary in Arneson as a gift to the city, and we will work to make it known to the citizens of Edina as a restorative garden. We are excited to introduce Tony, who will show you the plant. Tony. Commissioners, Director, thank you. I will try and move through the process that we went through fairly quickly. So if there are questions afterwards about the process piece, we can go back and look at it. I know everybody's always excited to get to the meat of the design and talk about the garden itself. So I'll try and get there as quickly as I can. So um, about two years ago, I was contacted by um, the uh, Memory Garden Committee to look at uh, some of these areas um, to possibly develop and Are they I don't know you you're all seeing that correct uh, everybody's fairly familiar with the area so I won't worry too much about the the map being up there um, but I just wanted to highlight where Arneson Acres was in the larger map and then um, in the park itself uh, the the Garden LA is the big feature um, and the Tranquility Garden just sits off to the east a short distance um, a small area, very different in personality. Uh, and originally, two years ago, what we did is we did a consultation where we came in um, and spoke with the, the members uh, about the ways in which the garden could be developed as a project, um, how to frame it. Uh, that transferred into uh, a more formalized relationship where we actually did the design work. Um, and what we wanted to, to do in that conversation was really identify some of the different areas of the Tranquility Garden area. Um, in the center was a peony garden, uh, a display garden. Um, the orange uh, area around the outside highlights uh, the actual outside edge of the Tranquility Garden. And then the blue on the very outside is, is an area that has a, a strong impact because the, the garden itself is very introspective. Um, originally there was a lot of uh, trees that, that surrounded it um, and enclosed it, so there wasn't a lot of views to the outside. Made it very tranquil, very calm, very uh, serene. When we did the consultation uh, in March of 2016, we walked the site. Um, the guiding principles that we discussed that day were that the garden should evoke uh, feelings of quiet, sanctuary, and introspection. It should be low maintenance, as every garden is ever, always wanted to be low maintenance. Um, planting should give four seasons of interest, uh, and not necessarily um, more desired that the plants all bloom. That's a little more uh, of a different texture than, than the standard garden uh, that's all blossoms. Uh, and more emphasis placed on textures and foliage color, and then also to provide berries or food sources for birds. These were the guiding principles that we started off with. Um, we took that and put together a process where we had a workshop, uh, four plus hours. Um, I, I took the committee and really put them through their paces to make sure that we got all of the conversations out on board. I figured if there are 10 of us in the room, that probably means there are 13 or 14 different ideas of what this garden should be. And I thought if we can all discuss them and get through some of those, we'll make sure that we're designing something that reflects what their views are for how it should be designed. The focus of the workshop, we identified uh, general garden styles that we were looking for, some of the features that they wanted to see, what the materials could be, um, focusing in on that seasonality, uh, what color palette they were looking for, what the user needs were, um, all very generic things that we would go through, but I wanted to make sure that we covered all of them before we started the process. From that workshop, we distilled a number of ideas about what those garden styles would be, uh, a mix of some formal to echo the LA, uh, some Japanese garden style. We talked about path layouts, entrances, how much garden versus turf, the seating areas. This was an important piece, right? Quiet con contemplative space, seating areas of one to two or three to four people, 15 to 20 person capacity in the entire garden. This is a very different style of garden. It's not about having large gatherings. It's about that quiet contemplative space. Um, stone and walls really uh, grounding it to the earth a lot. Um, really a Goldilocks style planting where it's not too jam-packed but it's spaced out enough that it um, really shows off some of the, the beauty of the, the garden um, plants themselves. Uh, benches, we looked at, a, at a, a, a number of different types so it wasn't just the standard garden bench that we could figure out some ways to have other pieces in there. Um, the committee really didn't want a rustic style. Uh, they were excited about the idea of a pergola, uh, potentially a sculpture, um, and a few other things. The paths, uh, it was decided that they really didn't want to have a mulch path 
path that got us back to that rustic idea. Um, and we wanted to always make sure that we were considering ADA considerations, even though there isn't a hardscape path directly out to the garden at this point. Um, with uh, the future uh, possible uh, master plan happening um, or any changes, at least once somebody got to the garden, they'd be able to move through there, uh, whether it be with a walker or a wheelchair. Additionally, um, we worked with Tim to make sure that uh, all the uh, uh, small carts and maintenance machines could get into the space as well. Uh, on the 5th of June of 2017, we prevented, presented four schematic design options that we had developed from those uh, workshop ideas. Um, and the full EGC membership was able to give feedback either at that meeting or online. Uh, members voted on their preferred option and they gave feedback on their favorite features. Um, those four, and I believe you have these in your packet, uh, were a central focus, um, really at the heart of the garden, something that was more of what we termed the journey uh, with, with less of a direct route into the middle. Um, this was more of a modern style garden, something that was different, uh, really more about um, uh, geometry and, and kind of coming at it from a different perspective that way. Uh, and then a braided paths, which introduced a lot of other features that we weren't able to introduce in the other ones. From these four, we put them together, um, and then we also had this small area off to one edge that we've referred to as the cloister. It's a, it's a subspace that, um, when this garden is developed, will be sort of adjacent and lost. And so we developed that into a potentially uh, a small reflective area off to the edge of the, the garden itself. Thus the idea of it being more of a sanctuary or a cloister. Taking those four ideas and all the information that we got from that meeting, uh, we reduced that into a hybrid. The idea here being we'd get a lot of those pieces in there without just en ending up with a muddled design. We really didn't want to take you know, one of column A, some of column B, and put it all together to end up with a little bit of everything. Um, we wanted it to sing on its own. What we have here is this hybrid design. Um, this is the overall layout. Um, there are a number of different pieces here, um, but you can see the, the, big, the big move is that um, there isn't a center heart that you can move directly towards. Um, and this came out of that concept of the journey. And the idea is that as you move into the space, you have to move off of that main path. So you see into the middle of it and you see some of these features, but you have to move around through it, which makes your path take longer, which makes it feel like a, a larger space than what it is. We also wanted to reinforce some of the feelings of uh, introspection in the space and enclose it and make sure that that wasn't lost. One of the things that we discovered um, in between the, uh, the hybrid design um, between the uh, schematic design and the hybrid design was that there were a lot of trees that were lost uh, over that last year uh, to disease and needed to be removed. It really changed the personality of that space. So one of the things we looked at is how we could replant some of that, maybe even taking out some of the other trees that had been shade pruned or weren't in good shape, um, and replace that to, to re-engender that feeling of, of introspection within there. The other way that we wanted to approach this was to introduce some ideas of uh, topography. Um, rather than just planting on a, on a flat plane, uh, introduce some uh, raised areas that uh, that mounding would then bring the plants up a little higher. It gives a little more relief to the space. Um, again, reinforcing that as you're moving through it, it has some different spaces, some different rooms. Um, and I'm not sure if this is legible, but um, it shows kind of how those, those uh, topographic mounds would be within the space and you would move through them. We would also use boulders to really kind of shape that space as well, to hold back some of that topography. It's real gentle, um, but the idea being that it would be noticeable, um, nothing more than a couple of feet uh, high, probably uh, 30 inches at, at most. Um, the boulders serve a secondary purpose because they are along the edge of some of the paths. Um, they would then also prevent, uh, pre present places where people could sit. Um, a little more rustic, but uh, not quite uh, so developed as to you know, say that it was necessarily a bench. Um, again, looking at that stone out outcropping to do the grade retention. Um, all of this comes together to create these sub rooms. Um, and not rooms necessarily in the sense that we're going to use trees to wall them off, but in that the way they're planted and that works with the topography, they create smaller contemplative spaces. So if you're sitting on a bench in one of these smaller rooms and somebody's in uh, another one of them, it, you don't necessarily interact in a way. The benches are, are set up in a way that you aren't directly across from each other. Um, you're able to look at uh, some of the plantings uh, that are highlighted rather than uh, it being more about a gathering space. Always anchoring back to that ones and twos or threes and fours, uh, small areas for conversation um, rather than larger gathering spaces. 
the, the real key that sets all this up is these primary paths. Um, the idea here is that uh, they are all a minimum of four feet wide. Um, and and uh, please excuse the, the scale on the side. Um, they've come from boards and from handouts, so they've all got different sizes on them. Um, but basically the paths, nothing would be under four feet. That allows the Cushmans to get in there and do the management. We can get some of the uh, mowers in there. Um, but then it's also easily navigable in a wheelchair. Uh, go quickly through some of the pieces. Um, we looked at the brick pavers as an option, giving that uh, kind of old world charm, um, rather than something that's more of a, a modern style, um, using the running bond pa pattern um, to highlight that. Secondary paths off to the side of those main path loops um, are smaller areas that would be irregular flagstone, a bluestone that would complement that uh, uh, brick color quite well. Um, but they're giving it a secondary piece so it's, it's noticeable that it's differentiated from the main path. These again would be navigable, but not necessarily as uh, wide of a path to get to it. Uh, gets you off a little bit into a smaller, more secluded area. Uh, one of the big pieces that we looked at, there are two, currently two entries into the space. They are both um, Arborvitae Arbors arches that allow you to get in. Um, we want to add a third and really kind of anchor all three corners with that um, to increase the amount of access to the space. Uh, and we think it'll bounce off nicely. Uh, this is a picture of one of the arches um, that we'd be recreating. Um, we want to create more of an entrance feature to it, more uh, uh, of an attraction uh, for those distant areas as you're in the LA, as you're walking among the rest of the park, you pick up some of these little signature monuments um, and it'll draw you into the park as well. Uh, the moon door was a, was a, a very strong piece uh, that the, the garden committee really fell in love with. Um, and the idea here is, is just that it's a, you know, this, this metal circle off to one side, less of a, of a you know, main entrance and a secondary little piece that uh, would allow you then access to that cloister space. Um, the other strong piece uh, that came about when we were talking about it was this idea of the uh, north stone fence, um, really to reinforce that idea of enclosure. Um, the idea there with the stone fence is a, is a, you know, something that ends up looking less like a, a wall um, that you would sit on and more um, hearkening back to um, sort of the agrarian style of, of stone fencing uh, that one would find in, in a place like uh, Scotland or Ireland. Um, and then ties into in that enclosure piece as well. And here's some imagery just to give you an idea of, of how that would look. Um, and large. Uh, then uh, the only area that we've created that's more of a, a kind of gathering space is this pergola area. Um, and it's less about having events there and more about just having spaces where a few more can gather. You can get out of the shade, there's a little bit of respite. Um, so right in the middle, um, there's an area with the pergola. Um, again, nothing ostentatious, not really highly developed um, with a lot of uh, scrolling or ornamentation. Something very simple, very elegant. Um, you can see a couple examples on the side there. Uh, on the back edge of that pergola and on the front would be a small uh, seat wall that you could then sit in and be out of the direct sunlight, a little bit more of a, a space to get away. Um, around the outside edge of the uh, large turf area out in front of the pergola um, would just be a stone edge to really set that off. Um, and then that entire space points towards a small uh, area for a sculpture. Um, whether that comes through donation or something, it would be an opportunity to put a piece in there. Um, the garden uh, committee felt very strongly that it would be a nice place to put a, a, a more abstract piece, um, less figurative, but something that then uh, drew attention to it in, in that area. Benches and seating, um, we tried to using the, the, the stones um, and uh, the seat walls to really hide a lot of extra seating in there so you have choices and they're all accessible, right? So some of them are right against the main path, some of them are tucked back in a little bit more. Um, but the idea there being that there were options for what you wanted to choose that you, if you couldn't get very far into there, maybe you still had an option to sit along the path. Um, one of the pieces that, that came about to one of the features was the bench swing, um, looking at the one that's over at Centennial Lakes um, and taking that idea and importing it here, but styling it much more similar to what the pergola would be um, to create a secondary piece that's a lot smaller off on the north end of the, the park. Uh, the seating areas, the benches, uh, just a standard teak bench, um, something that's more classic, uh, but uh, definitely is uh, hardy and will withstand um, quite a long time. 
So what I've highlighted here is a series of uh, where the benches would be and then also where the boulder seats would be, um, just to give you an idea of how they're, they're uh, spread throughout the entire space. The cloister itself was uh, developed as just a secondary little space and it's uh, kind of been um, decided that it would probably be an, an alternate uh, for down the road. Um, it wouldn't be in the first phase of, of building um, simply because it will cost a little bit more um, and they really wanted to focus on the main part of the garden. Um, but it's an option for um, expanding into that space and keeping that from, from being lost. So back to the overall layout. Um, I've hit the majority of the spaces on here, um, so I think I'll open it to any questions, either about process or pieces of the park. Okay, thank you, Tony. Questions for Tony? Sure. Uh, Member Miller here. Uh, I don't get a sense, or I can't get a sense of, of what percentage of Arneson Acres this is. Is it 90%? Is it 9%? Is yeah. it? Of Arneson Acres, it's, it's here, I'll go back to the image. It's very little. Um, maybe a quarter of a percent? <laughs> quarter of a percent? Yeah, it's, okay. it's a very small, small space. Okay. I know how legible that is. I think it's on mine. It's really tough. So if you look at um, on one of the the layouts, I think I had the the LA, or maybe it wasn't even on there. Um, don't know how to show it to you any closer. No, can I ask? Um, you, can I ask a question differently? So when you look, when you're, because I, I recognize, you know, the art park pretty well. So in the middle, that white dot, that's the, like the water fountain, correct? Correct. So if, if I'm thinking about where I'm at, um, and I've been to the garden show um, sale several times, um, so the, the um, greenhouse that's down there, and there's a parking lot, is that, where is that relative to the Tranquility Garden that's on here? So the greenhouse would be uh, all the way up at the end of the alley. And you're familiar with the, the gazebo up at the front of the alley there? Mm -hmm. So the alley you're mentioning at the front is at the top of the screen here? Correct. Yep. So, this, so if we're looking at this, this is the back, um, if you're walking in the back far left corner, correct? From 70th? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So in terms of, and if I guess, if I was trying to think about it, the size, if, if this is if from a scale perspective, just trying to think about how the sizing is, it looks like it's a little bit bigger than the area of the um, fountain. Yeah, so I think that'd be a good way to say it. the distance across that LA and around that fountain. It's about it's comparable to that. So we're talking about in terms of in terms of size. It, when you're looking at it, um, we're talking about it would be basically the back left corner, and it's basically equivalent to the size of the fountain area. If yes. you know that area. So it, I would agree it's pretty small. If that's the case, I think the map kind of throws it because it kind of makes you think it's at the very front, and that's why I think oh, it's helpful. Sure. It's mm. actually if you're standing on that top side of the looking down. Right, yes, yes. So it would be north-south. The image is, is north-south as yeah. you're looking at it. Okay. All right, and then another question. Um, is the city, or would the city, after it's constructed, well, would, it, would the city construct it, and would the city maintain it? I don't know if anybody knows that. The city will be maintaining it, um, I'm sure, along with efforts from um, the Garden Council. And as far as constructing it, um, yet yeah, we will work with Tony on following all of our um, city guidelines on bids and so forth, if that answers your question. Yeah, I was just wondering yeah. if, if, if the city was doing the shoveling and the planting, or is that no, outsourced? it's outsourced. Okay. It will be right. outsourced. So I just had a question on the phasing. So you, you had the note that the entire project was 60,000 60, and the phase one was 25. Is this phase one or what, what piece did we just look at? Okay. So this, what you just saw was the full phasing. It's the full, full garden. Thing. Okay. Yep. Um, what we'd be looking at in the first year is trying to get to a point where we could probably get the, the pathways in, the rocks, any of the hardscape um, so that that could be buttoned up. Um, for then the winter, and then phase two would occur next year. But in the meantime, there would be no open project. So. Okay, so the timing to, for the completion of the project is how long, do you think? Uh, well, some of that depends on fundraising. Um, uh, it'd probably be two, three years, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 
I have one question in terms of the way that it's going to look from a signage perspective. So we just did a lot of signs around the city. Is there gonna is this gonna require additional signage to tell people about it, or do, you, do people just gonna get to stumble upon it and then they find this tranquility guard? I mean, how do they find out really where it exists? <laughs> <clears throat> That's the million dollar question. <laughs> um, we're hoping that um, there will be forthcoming a kiosk at the north end of Arneson Acres, which would be right off the lower parking lot, that would help people identify different parts of the park, um, which is um, the alley um, and some other gardens that are on the west side, the um, Hosta Garden, the Shade Garden, a uh, Hybrid Lily Garden, and now uh, a replanted and new Peony Garden. These are all horticultural gardens um, which have involved um, the Peony Society and the Lily Society. Um, so we would like everybody to know where everything is. And we just know that um, we are kind of tucked to the southeast of the Allais. And we're hoping that if we get some signage up front, that that will help. Ultimately, what will help would be um, to have a hard uh, type of, of walkway that would go somewhere <laughs> from one end of the area to the other. We're not. We're not. Ho we're hoping that we do not pave the park. We do not want to do that. But we do want to see access to the park. And uh, we're very hopeful about someday getting a master plan for the park. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So you talked about that this might be a couple years away, still doing the fundraising efforts. Um, when you do break ground, when are you proposing? Will that cause any disruption to when the large amount of your traffic that walks through the park? I'm assuming that's spring, summertime, and into the early fall. Would there be... Is that, when is that proposed to start? If you, Happy Path, where would, where would you start? Happy Path, it starts this summer. Oh, okay. So, um, and my role as a designer wraps up. Uh, okay. I'm not the contractor, um, and my role will be to hand it off to the contractor. So there's, there's, a, there's a piece of that management that w is beyond what I'm really able to speak to. Um, the way we've talked about it is that we'd break ground this summer and try and get that phase one done before the fall. Yes, it will impact people being able to use that section of the park, um, and there will need to be an access route to it. Um, but I think uh, for the larger park, it isn't as, as major of an impact. It's not shutting down the parking lot or any access that way. Um, so I think there's, there's pros and cons. Sure. Thank you. Tim Zimmerman, uh, the city horticulturist who's, who, whose offices are at Arneson Acres Greenhouse. He has been working uh, uh, with the designers and stuff to identify the access route, and it's mostly going to be, instead of going all the way from the parking lot on the north side down through the, all the way to the south end, it's going to be from um, Larkspur Avenue and, and go straight across. That's a much shorter route. Got it. Yeah. Oh, just want to say, um, and I think <clears throat> when we do get a contractor, we will be... Uh, working with Tim and, and the Park Department to make sure that um, we have some things in, in place that say when they can access with their heavy equipment and um, what about parking and what about all those concerns that go with construction. I had one other question. Oh, um, so on the pathing, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you I'm not done. No, you're good. We'll break it up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> on the paths, those are just going to go out to green spaces, right? So you Correct. see how the entrance is, and they just go out to the rest of the park. Yes, it will end way. off into the grass so yep. that they'll be able to mow right up to it. Um, it'll somewhat be like you are coming upon a space that's been developed out in the middle of that grass. Um, ideally, it won't be completely abrupt. It'll be somewhat of a gentle transition into that. Okay. Excuse me. Um, I just want to add something that um, we discovered as we were trying to work through how we would um, renovate this area is that it is a favorite spot for photographers to pose people uh, near the arches. Um, and there have been some weddings in there, small weddings. So we, we kind of, you know, talked about um, that type of um, accessibility 
um, plus the fact that if you have the arch and we have some green space beyond, that that's perhaps another opportunity to have people gathering there. Um, and the third arch kind of focuses on the southeast corner of the park, which hasn't really had a lot of development, but Tim has been growing some really great trees over there. So we, we are kind of looking at the whole space. Okay, good, thanks. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful space and a really nice design, and you did a great job, so thank, thank you. Thank you. And jumping off of that, uh, and Mr. Workinger came in and talked about trying to be subtle with our revisions of the Arden Park. How much of this design is vastly different than what's currently at Arneson Acres, or is it a very subtle change, or is this the jumping off of potentially some other future garden projects for Arneson Acres? Well, I can take the first part. Uh, currently, inside the space that we're talking about redeveloping, um, there was a peony garden, um, and then it was basically turf around the outside of that. Uh, and so this is a renovation of that space. It'll be transformative. It will be completely different. Um, it won't be squeegeeing the site clean in terms of taking out the outside edge uh, that, that really envelops it, all that nice, beautiful arbovitae hedge and everything that'll all remain. Um, the idea there is not necessarily to um, change anything in the rest of the park around it, um, simply to work within those boundaries of that space. And currently there's almost nothing in there. So there's, there's a small cement pad and some turf, and that's all that's in there. And then the last question I had is you talked about fundraising, which is a topic that comes up with us and the Park Commission frequently. Um, is your fundraising just through your plant sale, or are you soliciting private donors? And if so, yeah. what success we're have you used, had? We're used to working for our money. <laughs> and as my dad said, is, uh, you know, the plant sale is, is one of those things that it's a coal mine, not a gold mine. But you know, we do get a very consistent good profit off of that. And also have had some garden tours uh, every other year for a while too. So we're kind of new in the fundraising business. You know, like I said, we're used to earning the money ourselves instead of going out there and saying, you know, but, but we are determined to do that because uh, kind of answer some of your question earlier about other areas of the park is, is that, um, first of all, the design of this is, is, is fairly traditional. You know, I mean, it's not like we're going to have a all Japanese room here, you know, and an all finished room here or something like that. You know, it's, it's fairly conservative, traditional garden look. Um, and uh, even the sculptures, uh, you know, I see, this is my personal opinion, but uh, I just see that the, the, the fountains and the, the sculpture pieces, are they're, they're more classical, simple, non-representational, okay? So I don't think that, you know, I think the continuity of the park will be fine. And, and we've added uh, lots of other places too, the woodland and the pollinator gardens too, but it all, it all flows well together. Um, does that answer? I want to just yep. address the fundraising. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, there is nothing that scares me more or that I am less able to deal with than fundraising. But uh, that doesn't stop a gardener, does it? Um, we, we started out with very, very minimal dreams. Like maybe we could just plant a little bit along the, the hedge in there to make it kind of more, yeah. And then we said, well, maybe not. And so as we expanded our dreams and our vision, um, we had to s kind of deal with the fact that, yes, we're expanding our budget and we're expanding it to the point where um, we are going to be out there in the community asking people to help us. Um, we have already invested in Tony and Ben um, and we have uh, presented a check to uh, the parks for $25,000 for this first phase. Um, we expect and hope to make at least $12,000 on our plant sale this year. Um, and it doesn't go as far as we'd like it to go, but we are um, trying to deal with some of the approaches that, that might be um, good for us. Um, among those are talking to different, com different groups of community groups that might be able to help support us. Um, and if we get our concept out there, um, we're hoping that somebody will be inspired to to kind of help even just donate some materials. 
Um, I actually did a, a, a guesstimation projection for the funding. So that's sixty-five thousand dollars. That included our fourteen thousand dollars for the design phase, and then the other roughly fifty thousand dollars, twenty-five thousand dollars for this uh, first phase of the construction, and then phase two and three will be uh, twelve thousand five hundred each. So that's our. So we we got most of it, but you know we're we're, we're realizing we need help, and we're, we're going to learn and we're going to do it. One of the things that came up early on with the point of fundraising is that there's a lot of people who like to leave uh, money for people who have been involved in the garden clubs before. Um, and so a few times we would talk about uh, this tree was in memory of so-and-so or um, somebody else was a, a, you know, a gardener in this space and this was planted by your family. Um, what we wanted to do is, is to figure out a way maybe to, to honor that moving forward. And so as we work through the phasing and looking at the different um, uh, ways in which we're listing things out. The idea of working with Anne and Susan to figure out how we can appropriately uh, allow people to fund that should they want to put money toward um, you know, trees at large or um, if it's appropriate to have a bench that's in memoriam. Um, that would be the next step now that we've got a design and we know what the features will be. We can start putting numbers to that and figure out what that'll look like in terms of hard cost. Um, and then if somebody wanted to donate a sculpture, uh, it makes that opportunity available. Can I ask one last question? I don't know, um, but I don't believe there is. Is there an opportunity to have, in terms of the summer programming, um, I'm not sure the right age would be, but, you know, for an up-and-coming kid or um, of some age, you know, in terms of all of our park and rec programming, is there something around, I don't know, I don't want to have kids in there destroying the gardens either, but in terms of, like, helping um, assist in building this, you know, I mean, I think about, when we talked about Arden before and how the stairs were put together from a Boy Scouts group, you know, if there's something that we could do from a, if they pay to attend, you know, they could also, you know, learn about gardening and then they could also, I don't know if that's an opportunity, but it might be something to explore as we look at how do we expand on their offerings for the park and rec programming as well as a opportunity to fundraise and um, help build in terms of it. I don't know if that's something that we've looked at, but I haven't seen that in terms of anything happening there, but it might be an opportunity. One of the challenge we, challenges we're running into with this is trying to figure out what can be done with volunteer labor versus what could be done with contractor. Um, and I know, having worked in that industry before as a contractor, it's a very tough thing to figure out how to manage both volunteer labor and volunteer materials. Um, and introducing kids into that equation can make it challenging. I think it would absolutely be something that could be developed um, by the garden clubs or, or you know, some component thereof. Um, I think it will make it more difficult for a contractor to figure out how to approach that. So maybe it's more about a maintenance thing or something like that rather than the actual construction. And I meant more of the, on the fundraising itself in mm -hmm. terms of having some form of a programming at the park that could help teach a kid about gardening so you can keep that gardening spirit alive and then maybe help with fundraising. I was just trying to brainstorm in terms of that. Sure. I don't need to um, dive, dive uh, too deep we in. have worked with um, Girl Scouts Brownies. Um, Karen has done a, um, a workshop with them last year, um, uh, doing seeding and finding out about the greenhouse and how that works. Um, and uh, some of our members have worked with um, kids in the past, um, doing different kinds of workshops. Uh, it's been kind of very under the radar, and you might not you know, have heard about it, uh, but um, uh, we are very interested, very interested in supporting uh, the young people to know kind of what's involved in gardening. And um, uh, very interested in some of the uh, gardens that have been uh, uh, developed at the schools, um, which is horticultural, vegetable type gardening, which we haven't really done a lot with. Um, but uh, yes, we, we do have uh, in mind the young people. and. If we can figure out a way to, to involve them, we will. And we are trying to, as far as fundraising goes, brainstorm about what kinds of activities or, or events might be attractive to families to come and have fun and to f explore the garden and find out about it. Any last questions? Maybe just kind of a summary on the, on the fundraising thing. Uh, all the dollars are being raised. They're not, it's not coming out of the regular city budget. Is that correct? Okay. And then 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. We know where to fundraise then. We can just right. come to you. <laughs> Even if you don't like it, you're starting to be successful. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then you guys talked about your your plant sale, but it sounds like there's 12 and a half K, but I'm guessing in a regular year, you're not putting it all towards the memory garden, right? So you've got right. other expenses. So there's only a We have some that. savings, you know, so that's part of the consideration was, was for my, my budgeting was working with some of our savings that we had over at the Edina Community Foundation and uh, in our own checking account. And then, because uh, we do have other expenses, we also pay for all the seeds and soil and pot supplies at the greenhouse uh, for there. And we and so there's some other expenses too. But you know, trying to incorporate those and everything. That like I said, I tried to work it. So I thought this this is this is what we can do. So we still have enough money to go buy the plants that we need to sell right. <laughs> next year, right. right? So right. Yeah. So how do you? I mean, how do you guys feel? Yeah. about being able to get it all done in three years versus five or six or oh, seven. Oh, no. Or... <laughs> I want to give you a committee member. <laughs> well, undoubtedly have it done in two years. <laughs> we are go-getters. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Good. Thank you. Tony, thank you for the presentation. And to echo Brenda's words, looks like a very thorough, well thought out design. So thank you for that as well. Thank you very much. And uh, most of all, congrats to the members of the Edina Garden Council for taking on the challenge and doing your fundraising and really driving this through as a council on your own. It, it's uh, very commendable. And I look forward to seeing what it looks like uh, next fall when this first phase is completed. So thank, thank you, you very much, much for the presentation. Greg, may I please jump in sure, and, go ahead, uh, and also thank this amazing group of volunteers, uh, Liz and Karen and, and Betty behind them. Uh, Susan and I have had just a tremendous experience working with this group uh, over the last few years. And I can assure you, if anyone can put together the fundraising and put together this project, it is this group. Um, they have had the initiative. They have done the majority of this work themselves, and I just can't thank you enough. Thank you for your efforts, and uh, the results so far have been tremendous. I can't wait to see the final result. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Do they know we need funding for playgrounds? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, next item on our agenda, um, Arden Park Ash Trees, and an update on the situation there. And Anne, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Greg, members of the Parks and Recreation Commission. Um, I don't have much of a presentation for you this evening. Um, as uh, all of you remember, we made a presentation to your group and the City Council a week ago. Uh, the City Council asked if you would consider making a recommendation to the City Council on uh, the ash trees at Arden Park. So here we are this evening. I also want to recognize that we have Luther Overholt, our city forester in attendance this evening. So he will be available to answer any questions that you might have uh, regarding ash trees. And uh, obviously Tom Swenson, our assistant parks and recreation director um, is here as well. I wanted to take an opportunity to, uh, to mention uh, another thing that we have going on tomorrow. I'm very excited to report that we have our first meeting of the committee that is going to be working on the Arden Park Shelter. Uh, we have eight resident members that will be participating in that group. And we also, from the Parks and Recreation Commission, have Corin, Julie, Eileen, and Rick. And uh, so thank you very much in advance. I know that uh, it's hard to coordinate all of the schedules. So between the eight and the four of you, and then we have several staff people and the consulting team as well. Um, it took a while to, uh, to be able to coordinate a time and a date, but we are meeting tomorrow at, uh, at 3.30 to start that process. So just wanted to have a, uh, a map available, uh, as you saw last week. Also wanted to point out uh, in the circle, it is the approximate location where the shelter building will be located. Uh, the shelter building um, 
the final, we're still only at the, not even to the 50% design phase. So there still could be some movement in the exact location of that building um, and the trail surrounding that building. So we'll be discussing that a little bit further as well. And then to the ash trees. So we have a couple of options for you this evening. Certainly you can take one of those options or you could make com a completely uh, separate recommendation as well. Uh, but just a reminder, we have uh, 457 trees within the project area. And we are estimating that with the entire project, again, keeping in mind that we're at the 50 to 60% design phase uh, next month, we're anticipating that 68 trees would be removed. Um, as a reminder, when we were in the initial uh, sketch plan phase of this, uh, we were anticipating that we were going to be losing about 90 trees just for the creek alignment alone. Uh, as we promised, uh, we promised that we would go back and take a look at that creek alignment and uh, do the best that we could to save as many trees as possible. And uh, so hopefully this uh, re-establishes uh, that uh, goal with the community and with the Parks and Recreation Commission. We've cut down significantly the number of trees that will have to be removed as part of this project. So of the 68 trees that we would anticipate removing as part of the entire project, 24 of those uh, trees are ash trees. In total, there are 77 ash trees in the park project area, and 47 of them have a diameter at breast height of less than 12 inches. Uh, Luther, our city forester, has recommended that we treat three specimen trees. And I know this is really hard to see on the map. Uh, Luther, I might have to have you help me with one. There is one over along Minnehaha. There is one near the playground. And then there is one over here on Brookview, correct? Uh, those are the three trees that, uh, that Luther is recommending treating uh, to maintain. Is that ash trees? Those are three mm -hmm. ash trees, correct. Um, so again, as I mentioned and as we talked about with the city council last week, we brought to you two different recommendations. If you have a, a different recommendation, uh, staff would uh, be happy to work on that as well. Uh, but what we are proposing, um, first proposal is to remove at least 50 of the 77 ash trees in the project area. 24 of those 50 um, are already part of the uh, initial number that we would be removing. Um, this would remove approximately 94 total trees in the park, and that's 21% of the tree cover in the project area. The other uh, option is to remove all 77 of the ash trees. Again, 24 of those are already part of the project construction. This would remove approximately 121 trees in total, and uh, that is approximately 26% of the total tree coverage. Uh, one very unique opportunity that we have as part of the project is we do have a project budget for tree replacement. So as Emerald Ash Borer has not yet officially hit Edina, it is in every surrounding community. So it is only a matter of time before it's going to, uh, it's going to be uh, found in Edina. Luther could talk to you a little bit more if you have any more specific questions about the spread and how long we think it's gonna take to get here and, and those types of things, but I think um, it is safe to say that it will be here. It will be here soon. Um, it's very close by in um, Bloomington. It's close by in Minneapolis. Um, so the, the question is, how aggressive do we want to be with this opportunity with the construction that we have going on in the park? Uh, we would propose with either of these recommendations or another one that you might want to bring forward, we are proposing that we would replace these trees that we're removing at a minimum of a one-to-one -one ratio. This is an opportunity that we will not have again in the future um, because we would be able to incorporate that as part of this project budget. I wanted to mention also, uh, Mr. Lorenz mentioned as part of the community comment portion of the uh, of the agenda this evening, Luther has already spoken to uh, Wood from the Hood 
um, and he would be able to answer any questions that you might have about that as well. It would be an opportunity that we would be able to, uh, to pursue to sell some of the wood uh, to that company for reuse. So with that, I would like to stand to answer any questions that you might have. And I want to bring Luther up with me, and, uh, and Tom's available too, if you have any specific So Rick questions. said he's got a couple, so Rick, why don't you start us off? Yeah, um, the difference between 77 and 50, and then the relationship between the 21 and 26, so 27 trees only equal 5% of the cover? If I figure that right? Are those small trees then, or? Because it says here uh, 50 equal 21, and then 77 equal 26. Is that correct? Uh, I'm sorry, it was, it was. Okay, but I'm just looking at the, the 50 versus the 77. And, and is that that's applying to the total tree cover, right? So it's we started out with 457, yep. and so the okay. additional yep. additional it's, trees is only okay. about five percent. Yeah, yeah, it's of the total tree canopy um, in the entire park. Yes, yep. that's correct. Thank you. Can you address the uh, safety issue if we keep the other 27? Um, so once the trees become infected, uh, they lose their structural integrity. The bugs they lay their eggs there. When they hatch, they chew through the part of the tree that brings water and nutrients up to the top of it. So um, within a year to two years, all the trees will be that are you know within striking distance of a path or street would be considered hazardous. Um, right now, uh, lots of other cities that have this going through, they're uh, in some cases having problems getting uh, tree services to even remove the trees because they are so dangerous and the only option ends up being uh, crane removal just for safety for the uh, workers and so with that that also increases the price a lot if, if it does get to that point uh, to get them out of there um, also could you uh, do you have an idea of the cost versus removing now versus waiting till periodically they die um, not sure about cost. Like I, I do think this is something that um, you know, with any option that uh, is chosen, the remaining trees. If there are remaining trees, I would be able to handle in house with my current staff um, for the removals. The only issue may be uh, the north end there, where the stairs are going in. I would be losing my access down there. Uh, right now, in the past, we have driven down that little trail to uh, remove other hazardous trees and trees with Dutch elm disease. But once the stairs go in, I won't be able to get in there at all, so that would be uh, an issue. But you also have to manually carry all of the trees out, correct? If you are, if you and your team and you don't have the access with a Cushman to be able to bring that stuff out, is that right? Then, yeah, we would be, uh, or in, if, if it's not by uh, the path or a trail, I would be most likely leaving the trees there and not removing them. Can, can you do that? I thought we heard before need, they needed to be like buried or something like that, if they have that. Uh, so right now there is no you know, ordinance here in the city or statewide for trees with emerald ash borer. Um, it is recommended to get them out. Um, I have this past week, I spoke with all the other cities around us. Um, we all have large forested areas and I know Minneapolis, um, you know, by the river, Bloomington, Minnesota River Valley, they are not removing any trees in there, they're letting them all stand and die in natural succession. Other questions? Um, our ash trees, uh, if we revisit history, 1983, I understand the tornado went through Arden Park. Were these ash trees that people might have planted? Um, or not? Some of them it's possible, lots of them are probably just volunteers, um, you know, mm -hmm. they're prolific cedars and so once they you know the little their seeds go everywhere and so you just kind of get lots of yeah volunteers trees I doubt you know they're like the the three that I'm planning on treating those I think may have been actually planted back then because once Dutch elm was the other thing that came through mm -hmm. back in the 70s and 80s and so people stopped planting elm trees and started planting ash trees um, as kind of the new tree of choice for boulevard trees thank you Julie so you're talking about treating three trees. 
And I think a natural question is why, why just three and why not more and how successful is treatment? And are some cities looking at treating more as a percentage versus taking them down? Where are we on that? Um, so uh, the three trees, when I, I walk through the park, those uh, the one of them is right by the playground. It gives shade to the bench right by the playground. So that one I've, is, you know, it's large. It's probably about 24 inches, uh, good shade. And so I was like, okay, this one I think is a good one to save. The other one over on uh, Minnehaha is right between where the new sidewalk is and the curb. And so uh, if that one were to be removed, it would not be a large enough space where I would even consider planting another tree. Mm -hmm. And so that one being the size it is and where it is, it's still in good health. That's one I would treat just because there'd not be another good option to replace there. And then the other one over on Brookside is um, kind of standalone by itself. Uh, up in, you know, up in a, it is a mode maintained area around there, but that's, you know, it's the other reason I treat that one. The other ones um, in the woods, it gets very difficult to get the equipment. Um, lots of them you have to, they'll use like a, a, they're basically pumping this chemical into the tree, drilling holes in the roots. And so you can't get, you know, they need to get their truck down there usually to hook up for the pump and everything. And so it's just hard to get in there and treat. Um, as far as other communities, um, what they're doing, um, as far as treatment goes, um, Richfield, they are treating uh, the majority of their um, kind of specimen trees that are in good health. Um, they are responsible for you know everything in the right of way there and in their parks. And after speaking with them, they're they're going to try and treat as many of them as as possible. Um, Minneapolis, they're not treating any trees at all because uh, they cannot uh, you know confirm or deny that the chemical used in the trees will not harm any pollinators. That's their reason behind doing no treatments, they're replacing everything and cutting down all the ash in, in the city and their right of way and parks. Um, Bloomington, they're uh, doing most, mostly all removals there as well. Um, some specimen trees and you know, some of their parks they're treating, but otherwise they're uh, removing all of them. And then, yeah, like I said, both cities with you know, the, the rivers in there, that's very hard to get into. They're leaving everything in there um, just to die naturally. And um, Eden Prairie is kind of doing the same mixture of treatments and not, you know, and removals and, um, you know, lots of preemptive removals just to try and get the amount of trees, you know, down before um, the population builds up and then all of them will kind of die at the same time as the, the fear. And then I may have missed this. But what do you think the timeline is for when we would expect to see this hit Edina, right? Like I, I believe it is here already. I just haven't found it. Okay. Um, and so usually they say once you have found it, it's already been there for you know two to four years. Because when there's just one bug in the tree, it's not very noticeable. By the time you find it, the population's built up. And it's usually uh, the woodpecker activity that alerts you to it. And so um, it's something I've been you know, looking for. And I think I will be finding it you know, soon. Because yeah, like Ann said, it's in everywhere around us ex except for Hopkins. They haven't found it there yet, but mm -hmm. everywhere else has it. And Luther, is the treatment process one time, or is it ongoing annually? And any um, sense of how much that costs to maintain the, it? From yeah, treatment? The, the treatments are um, every two years for the rest of the life of the tree. You have to do it uh, because until the and, and, or until all the ash trees around are dead. Mm -hmm. That's because otherwise, if there's still ash trees out there, that's food for the the insect, and so they'll keep feeding. And so, right at this point, though, it's the remainder of the life of the tree every two years. And it's uh, the I've been doing it now for three years. The first uh, three years ago, when I got my prices, it was about thirteen to fifteen dollars an inch. Uh, this past year. Um, it's down, I've got it down to $7 an inch is about what I'm paying from the, the city side. And I do anticipate that getting down to maybe about five or so, just as, uh, you know, more tree companies are buying this chemical and treating more trees, the price has been going down. So it's relatively new, you know, a couple of years ago when I started doing it and now with more communities having the same issue. Uh, the price is going down. And that's based on the diameter of diameter the tree that you're per, treating? Yeah, okay. per inch. Yeah, per inch of tree. Yep. All right. Other questions? Ch Chemistry-wise, uh, I mean, uh, pumping chemicals into parks 
doesn't sound like a great idea just off the top of my head. Uh, is it contained in the tree? Is there any warning once it's treated that kids shouldn't be around it, dogs shouldn't be around it, um, I shouldn't be around it? No, not, so yeah, it's not like when we go and do our fields where we post a sign, don't play here for however long. Um, what they do is they end up uh, digging around the base of the tree, all the way around the base of the tree a little bit to get down to um, the, the larger roots that are kind of below the subsoil. Uh, they drill small, like maybe a centimeter hole in the roots and then put, you know, kind of prongs all the way around it with tubes, uh, turn on a pump, takes like, a, depends on the size of the tree, up to an hour, could be a couple hours to get it all the way through the entire tree. And then when they're done, take it out, put the soil back up there. And so those holes are covered up. So, um, but I can't, I can't guarantee, you know, I don't know about the exposure risks. You know, like I said, Minneapolis, they're not doing any uh, treatments at all just because of the chemicals. Mm -hmm. And, and what are the uh, theoretical replacement trees? If we took one out and did a one-for-one, one, what would we be putting in? Um, so I'm kind of basing that off of uh, our current uh, tree ordinance we have, you know. So for all the, I go to all the teardowns here in Edina, and, you know, based on certain parameters, if they remove a tree, they have to replace it. Um, right now, any size tree they take out, they just have to replace it with a two-and-a-half-inch caliber tree. So I'd recommend, it, you know, planning on doing at least two and a half inch. Um, I've been working with some uh, other contractors that do large tree spaded trees. Um, so I've got, you know, I've been doing those for the past probably five years now um, to replace, you know, when I take out, you know, big trees that die because of Dutch elm, instead of putting a little, you know, whip in from the nursery, I've been getting these uh, nine foot tree spaded trees that are already about, you know, five inches in diameter and 20 feet tall, so it's kind of more instant shade. Uh, I'm looking at working with another guy that he moves up to 12 inch trees. And so that's like a 12 inch, 30 foot tree. That's like a, you know, pretty full grown tree already. So that's what I'd recommend, but, you know, for some, some just of the replacements. any kind or is it, I mean. Um, all, you know, Linden, uh, oaks, or? maples, um, you know, lots of variety, Kentucky coffee tree, you know, lots of people are starting to uh, grow, you know, kind of more southern climate trees with just the way our climate's been. And uh, I've been planting those and having success with those as, as well here throughout the city. So a wide variety, you know, of all disease resistant, um, you know, trees that do well in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Okay. Brenda? Okay, I have a few questions, kind of follow up, just things that spurred questions from your other discussion. So are you treating any um, uh, specimen trees in other parks? Yes. Or, oh, how, yeah. So how many do we have in our park system? Um, right now only like 15, so not, not that many, yeah. Okay. And I thought we had something where we, we weren't able to use, um, I don't know, like weed killer or whatever on any of our surfaces at the parks. Do we have other? This doesn't fall within that because it's not um, like, uh, like topical, is that why, Anne? Yes, that is correct, and we do have uh, we do have an ordinance that we follow for uh, for treatment uh, throughout the park for all the turf areas. Um, and then, has what kind of success rate have other communities have using this particular treatment? So the they they say you know the uh, tree companies will say like a hundred hundred percent. Right now, they'll give me like a guarantee on my tree if if the tree gets it, you know, they'll refund you. Uh, you know your money um, but I've you know it's still fairly new there's still research going into it but I kind of you know I'm very familiar with Dutch Elm and the treatments for that and that that too they would say is 100% I still know I mark about you know, maybe five to ten every year that the owners have you know religiously treated doing their treatments on time but they still get it so it's more of a you know kind of preventative and suppresses it if you know once the population gets you know really high um, it can still get in there, you know, just between that little gap at the end of like the, the two years and stuff. And so I'd say like 90% effective. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's pretty effective. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then I just wanted to make sure I was clear on the 68 trees that are going to be removed for the um, creek. Those are going to be replaced too? Right. Okay. And I think it, there is a big 
consideration on the replacement if you're going to be doing the larger trees, like you said, five inch or more. To me, that seems much more reasonable, and I can kind of picture that. They're going to grow quickly. Um, so if you did put a five inch tree in, when, like how long does that take to get to like a 12, 12 inch diameter? What's, what's kind of a rule of thumb for that? Um, I don't know. You know, all the trees, they grow different speeds and stuff like that. The maples, much quicker than the oaks, but it'd probably be like another, you know, 10 years to, you know, 20 years before they, yeah. So in about 10 years, it'd be maybe close to what it was being replaced, potentially. Yeah. If you did a five inch. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the other thing I was concerned about is that you had said that in the future, you would, if you had to take these down, you just leave them in the park, right? So they, mm -hmm. they just have... Um, tree trunks in the park in our natural wooded unmaintained areas yes unless there's you know a, a path going by there those ones I would go and get out for safety reasons but um, otherwise that is kind of the way I'm if I could add a little bit of detail to that, that was one point that um, I think is worth noting on the first option, is um, if we decided to go with an approach that does not remove all of the ash trees, uh, what we would do is, um, as a staff team working along with our consultant team, is we would uh, very specifically pick the trees that we wanted to replace and the trees that we would want to leave at this time, and we would make sure to take out the trees that are going to be difficult, impossible, or would impact construction work that had been previously completed and make sure that those are part of the trees that we take out now. Um, because as Luther said, there are going to be areas that are going to be difficult or impossible to reach in the future. And it would be our goal um, in this park to try to get as many um, not only now, but in the future out. As Luther mentioned at the last meeting, you know, essentially if you leave any trees on the ground, they're, they're just turning into a breeding ground uh, for this disease, uh, which will not be good for the neighbors in the community either. So um, it would be our goal if we do not take the approach to remove all of them, that we would be very specific and intentional of the trees that we remove. So if I could just to clarify that, Brenda, does is, is that imply more on the northern end of the park than the southern from the map that you had up before? Yeah, I'll let Luther answer that specifically, but I think it is very safe to say that that northern part is going to be difficult or impossible to reach moving forward without um, negatively impacting construction. Yeah, so um, the, the trees there, once the project's done, um, it's going to be yeah, very difficult to get any kind of uh, equipment down there. The only way to you know, get stuff back out will be to manually you know, cut them down, chop them up, and carry them out. Um, I have done that in the past. It's, you know, it's doable. We have like the Crawl Hill area. Uh, it's a big wooded area. I've had oak wilt up there. Same thing, you have to get the wood out of there. And that's one, another area where it's uh, inaccessible with equipment, and so we'll do it in the winter, cut it down, and then kind of have sleds to put stuff on and push it out. Um, that was going downhill, uphill would be yeah, a little more tricky, but it, you know, it's doable, but it's not, uh, not, not easy. Sure. Brenda, any more questions? I had a, one more question, which was I noticed in the write-up, it talked about the removal of the buckthorn, which is going to be really nice, I think. Um, but what's, so you'll be able to maintain that removal. I know that can grow back. What, so what's the plan for for that. Thank you for, for mentioning that, Brenda. Um, yes, a big part of this project is uh, native restoration and removal of invasive species in general. And so we would be removing the buckthorn in the park. And I wanted to make sure that the commissioners were aware of that because right now there is a lot of buckthorn in that park. And just removing the buckthorn alone is going to significantly change the look of the landscape in that park. So I just wanted to make sure that, that you are aware that that is going to also significantly change the look in the park. To answer your question specifically, you are exactly right. Um, the 
maintenance of buckthorn removal areas is critical because if you don't stay on top of that for the next two or three years, it is going to come right back. And so we are going to be including as part of the scope of this project to have a three-year maintenance plan for the, for the buckthorn. So with that and with the treatment that we would do and with the removal techniques, um, we would st we're still going to have to keep up on it for a while, uh, but the first three years are going to be the most critical. Okay, good. Thanks. Thanks, Anne. And so do you think we could stipulate, I'm just going to ask, like, that the size of the trees? Because I really feel like that's, uh, that kind of changes the way I think about it, because if the trees are going to be larger, I, I'm more comfortable with taking out more, because I think they're going to get back to the coverage and the park will look, you know, kind of back to where it was, or... Do we, do we have that ability to include that? In Absolutely. The, okay. Mm. Matt? Uh, I, this is a question for Anne. In our uh, joint session with the city council last week, we talked about uh, Arden Park and some of these things and spent some time with the trees, and it felt like a few of the council members, maybe a majority of them, were leaning one way or the other, but then Member Staunton at the end was said, I don't, I don't think we want to jump the gun. Has there been any other discussion or any other information or feedback from that group that we should be considering as we're putting together our motion? There has not. No, there has not been any further discussion. I thought it was pretty clear that the council left um, the room that night saying they would love to hear a recommendation from the Parks and Rec Commission. My, um, my plan moving forward would be to take your recommendation to the city council when we report back at uh, the 60% report in um, in early May and uh, make your recommendation and then ask them to make a decision so we can continue to move forward with the overall park design. And Luther, just a, a question on concentration of trees. And that's a fairly small area and I probably know the answer, but we'll get the expert. If there was 100 trees in Arden Park that were ash, would they get infected faster than if there were five ash trees in Arden Park, or is it basically a tsunami and whatever's there is just going to get wiped out? So all of them are going to die that if they're not if they're not treated. Um, the the bugs are um, capable of flying up to 15 miles, but um, what they found is normally when they emerge, uh, lots of them will just go and reinfest the same tree. Uh, they're pretty lazy; they won't. They don't fly far if they don't have to. They just go to the same tree or the next closest tree that uh, already has, you know, some issues and is distressed. Uh, that that's what attracts them is the the pheromone the trees give out when they've, you know, already are in drought stricken or, you know, got hit struck by lightning or you know aren't in uh, as good of a condition, and um, they will go and re you know reinfest that tree until the up and down the entire tree on you know any branch, you know, three inches and larger. There's galleries on the entire entire tree. Does that answer your? I think question? so. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions or clarifications? I think we have a couple things uh, in front of us. One is uh, what's on the screen right now. Could be a choice of one recommendation or another. Uh, remove at least 50 of the 77 ash trees. Um, or the second one is remove all 77 ash trees in the pro park project area, or there could be a third if someone would like to suggest a third. And I think a second item that we could then also address is picking up on Brenda's comment, and maybe it's a separate motion to talk about the size of the replacement on the one for one and a strong recommendation of what that should be so that the park more quickly gets back to, to what it is today. Can I ask just one more question to Anne? Sure. I know this is covered. We the reason why um, we'd want to do this now is because it can be covered in the current. Is it in the current budget of the Arden Park plan, or, or why why is it covered? We do have included as part of the initial proposed project budget um, a very healthy uh, landscaping and tree replacement budget, and we did that on purpose. Um, for this reason, um, as we're only, I keep saying this because it's really important for folks to know that we put together an anticipated project budget. 
um, until we have a complete final design done. Uh, with this being one of the aspects, we don't know exactly what everything is going to cost, but we did put together a very significant plant and tree replacement budget as part of this project budget. As you can imagine, with the re-meandering of the creek, um, a lot of native restoration, a lot of the buckthorn removal, um, it's very important that we restore this to the very best of our ability um, and to restore the rustic, natural character of the park. Okay, perfect. And is, so is part of it going to be covered by the Minnehaha Watershed District that in there? component that they put in is that yes it is actually okay. yep anything that um, that would be impacted by the creek construction or creek re-meandering uh, would be um, would be part of the mini higher creek watershed district budget okay, that's what I thought it is. so remember the commission that has a strong passion about one or the other or a third option the time to entertain a motion if someone's got one in mind well, my question would be just which one is more economical in the long run? Because if it's cheaper to just remove them all now instead of waiting a few years when they're all infected, it, it's just, I mean, for me personally, it's just which one would be more budget friendly, I guess. Well, I think, yeah, it, uh, I think it brings up a very good point in that they're all going to die. Mm -hmm. And it sounds to me like time frame, a realistic time frame is five to seven years. So they're gone. It's just how many years do we want to be able to look at them before they die and have yeah. to be taken out? Um, as well as we can actually replace them now. And I think that's the part that's the big one is we can wait for them to enjoy them for five to seven years, maybe 10 years. But in the end, if they're going to die and it's going to be harder to remove, and when, which is going to cost us money to remove, and we don't know at that point, will we be able to replace them with dirt or another tree? And right. I think that's the part that's scary is if we left them all and we are most of them and then they died and then we may be able to replace even half versus a one-to-one, -one, I think that's the part that would really, in terms of you know your point earlier, making sure we're keeping the beauty there, making sure that we're keeping the beauty and the safety um, that in 10 years, it may not be as safe to get the trees out or to be around those trees because, especially when you say that we don't even know what's infected until it's infected. And you know, I mean, I don't want to be underneath the tree when it accidentally falls on me or my family. You know, I mean, that happens. I mean, it didn't happen that long ago in Eden Prairie that a tree was infected and fell on a person. I mean, it's, it, it happens. So I think that that's something else to keep in mind. If it's, there's a safety issue as well as the keeping it beautiful, I think is in. My, me personally, just in terms of my, I would go with taking them out. Um, I, would, I would move if we were asking for a motion. I would yep. move that we would take them out. Now when we know that there's a budget to replace them, we know that there's a project already in the park to work in addressing the park, as well as keeping the safety and beautiful park and the safety in mind. Um, that, would be my, that would be my move. So Corin's made a motion to remove all 77 of the ash trees in the park project area now. I a second. second. Pat, a second? Discussion? Well, I, I guess I'd, I think it's a little dangerous to say that if we do it now, we have a budget to replace everything. But if something happens in the future, there's absolutely no way we could replace a, tr a tree. So to say 120 trees, yeah, it would be difficult. 25 trees would be hard. 10 trees would be, mm, yeah, maybe doable. So uh, to me, it's a little dangerous to say it's all or nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, and if, that's what I was trying to say is we, we, know we, we know we could replace them. We just don't know we would for sure be able to replace them at a one-to-one -one or a more than one-to-one -one ratio. I mean, I think we still could replace them, but we may only be replacing parts of them. And that's the thing that I see is the difference. So yeah. one of my, th oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's okay. I would say I agree, and I think that this, the hard thing, though, is that this is happening at a time where there's a lot of work that's going to be done to the park, and it is going to, like, it sort of exacerbates this issue about a lot of change happening in the park at the same time. But I think in the long term, it'll be better for the park to invest in this now. But I think the piece that the city is going to have to do well is communicate why this change is happening now, if this is what they go with because I worry that it's gonna look like a lot of change in the park 
immediately now um, as part of this project, as opposed to if in four years, five years, all these trees die because of Emerald Ash Borer, which we expect to happen, it's not tied to the project. So I think it's important that the park, or the city and the park commission be communicating sort of why we feel that this is ultimately a long-term and good investment for the park, because it will, it's a lot of change at one time. But I, I support removing all of the trees. I just am worried about that communication piece. Mm -hmm. um, so folks understand long-term how this is ultimately benefiting the park. So what I was going to say is, you know, I think by the time this project is finished, there's the, it's going to be in that park, which is unfortunate. Um, and I, I, that's why I feel really strongly like if we could plant the right size trees so that as the, as the park, um, you know, there's going to be so much change and so much growth that's going to need to happen if they can grow with that. And so in f five years, the park looks back more to a normal kind of... Um, foliage or whatever it might be. So I, I really feel that we need to add some sort of addendum to the motion to have the right size tree. And I don't know what that is. You mentioned five inches. You mentioned 12 inches. I would go with the largest that we could um, feasibly put in. But could we have options instead of just one or the other? You know, to say we want to replace one to one I'll make up a, a percentage. 85% of them we can do a 5-inch tree or a 12-inch okay. tree. But there's 15% of them that, you know, for their size or their location, let's invest a little more mm -hmm. and put in a whatever, 20-inch tree or I don't know how you buy them, but, uh, you know, something bigger, uh, but strategically, not just right. all or one. So without attempting to become the tree expert that Luther is here today for us, Brenda, what I hear you saying is you would like to ask for an addendum that says, if we're going to take all 75, 77 out, the one-for-one one replacement should be with at least tree, trees that are at least five inch in diameter or larger. I'm kind of going with that number just because that's what Luther said. Right. And, and Corin, what would you? You were the motion maker. What would you think of that as a, an add-on to your motion? I'm trying to read by the motion across from me. I've seen this section, so I don't Let's, know. Why don't we pause and get uh, some input from Luther yeah. if you have some expert opinion for us? Uh, yeah, the larger the largest tree right now I can get is, is 12 inches, and that's. Uh, a lot more expensive than the the five inch ones I can get for you know I'm getting from right around like 700 each and that's planted installed. Um, another issue with the, the the tree spade it's a trees on the back of a large truck, so it has to be able you know somewhere where we, we can drive into where I can plant those spaded trees. Um, so there are going to be lots of smaller like the two and a half inch trees like what I require right now in our city ordinance. Those will have to be planted in areas by the the creek and the lowland areas where. I can't have an operator drive a large truck in there. Um, I'm actually going out to the this other tree farm that has the 12-inch trees. I, I have not worked with them yet. I'm going there tomorrow morning um, to get some trees for some other projects I've uh, been you know working on um, planted. And so I, I'm not positive on the price. I know he said for the five to eight-inch trees, it's uh, $80 an inch. Uh, eight to 12-inch, it's $100 an inch. And then the more trees you buy, the cheaper it is too. With his, with the delivery, and everything, you know, if I'm buying one tree, it'd be way more than buying, you know, 20 or more more trees from him just with the, you know, bulk kind of pricing and stuff. So, I would have to, you know, work with them on on that and figure out, you know, how many I would want of those large, you know, 12 inch trees to figure out exactly sure. the the prices. But besides the cost issue, what I heard you say, Luther, is there may be some parts of the park where physically it's not advisable to try to put in something larger than the two and a half inch um i i could uh so i, I could that that's just the standard in our ordinance okay. um, i can get you know bald and burlap trees and then containerized trees in like 20 gallon pots that um there may be yeah, like you know three three to probably four inch tops and those you know you can move around manually or we lots of times we'll put them on carts to get them down to where we're we're moving them or, you know, on a pickup truck with four-wheel drive, we could drive and uh, 
smaller areas than where the, the large tree spaded tree would be able to get mm -hmm. get to. So Luther, just you know, the 68 trees that were part of the original plan, what size were those going to be? Was it like kind of a? That haven't really made any decisions okay. on, mm -hmm. on any of that yet. Yeah. I would obviously, I'd be opting for trying to get the biggest, you know, with this opportunity, I, I'm trying to get the biggest ones I can get um, that are already, you know, larger. And uh, I also have better success with those, with that nine foot spade. Um, I don't have to water them as much. Their root system is already mature and, you know, starts taking, you know, nutrients and water from its surrounding as soon as it's put in its hole. Um, sometimes, you know, with the smaller trees, you know, I'll, you know, they're not as, uh, not as you know hardy and stuff and so you know i do have issues with some of those dying even though i'm watering them and taking care of them they just you know the stock you get from the nursery isn't always you know dependable okay. but. at the risk of sounding like a broken record um, i have to say again because we're only at the 60 percent phase um, we don't know exactly where those trees are going to go, but I can tell you that as we get a little bit further along in the design phase, we will be able to tell you exactly the size of tree that we will be recommending for each particular location. So that'll all be part of a very detailed landscaping plan. So maybe so, we add something that's more good. about um, the largest size that seems appropriate for that location. I Right. Okay. Like yeah. Uh, the, I guess the question I have is, if I'm looking at the numbers, 24 of these trees are going to get removed regardless, right? Just because of the river. So really, there's 53. If we were to remove all 77, 53 of those trees are incremental. We'll call them incremental removals. Um, and if we replace them with the 12-inch tree using the most expensive numbers that uh, Luther just quoted, we're looking at an additional roughly $65,000 for those trees. And I'm assuming that that price includes transportation and install. So an, an incremental $65,000 of expense. Do we have enough float in the current budget for this project to incur the most expensive, let's just plan for the most expensive, and do we have that in the do we have that currently? Because of where we are in the project design, I can't answer that because I don't know what the rest of the overall planting uh, for the park is going to require. And honestly, off the top of my head, I don't even know what that budget. Luther, do you do you remember what the project budget was for landscaping and tree replacement? Yeah, I I have a number in my head, but I don't want to say it because I am not sure that it's correct. But it's more than that. Yeah, I mean, because for me, I think I agree with Corn's motion and Brenda's amendment, and I have the same concerns that uh, Mike has, too. I, th I think if we're going to do this, let's plan to a number we think we can all agree upon that is what the basis of the amendment would be of a one-to-one -one ratio, and then that's what the cost we expect that that cost could be. And if we are all comfortable with that, then that, to me, is then how we can move forward. And just realize it's also it's not opportunity cost, but it's deferring future costs because you leave the ash trees, we got to pay to take them out later. Exactly. You know, it, it's it, we're not avoiding any cost by uh, taking them out now. Uh, not maybe Luther wants to plug his ears, but he's going to be doing it. He's a salaried employee, so and, and theoretically, right. If something comes down, it's part of his job to remove. I, I, I'm not. I guess part of my wanting to do it now too is I want to take this responsibility off of you and your team. I don't think this is something that we need to have you continually doing so, and going in there. Uh, so yeah, with that, you know, we we try to do as much as we could. But like I was saying, you know, some of them they will get to the point where they're hazardous, and a crane would be the only option. We don't have a crane here, so that would be I would be hiring, you know, some of those more tricky ones out uh, if, they, if they get to that. And those are like 2500 can be very can, expensive. Can be 10, you know, some, you know, when it's in your backyard and people are getting crane jobs, mm -hmm. trees out, that's over 10,000, that can be $10,000, mm -hmm. easy. You have a helicopter, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, to your point though, um, Luther's gonna have a lot of trees at some right. point with all the parks, and so if there, we at least had one exactly. park that was, um, already starting to grow and coming back would be very beneficial, I'm sure, to him. But. So, Brenda, am I correct in trying to state that 
at this point you might say your amendment is replace the trees with the largest size feasible in the park design. That makes sense to me. Okay. And budget. And budget. And we won't know more about the budget, Ann, until we get past 50% design. That's correct. And, uh, that is a, a motion that I would feel very good about, too, just because I think it's really hard at this point to be specific. But I do want to add, too, it's really difficult for us as staff to make this recommendation as well. Um, to Julie's point, I think it is important to know it's going to be a very um, you know, dramatic, different mm -hmm. look. Again, I wanted to mention the buckthorn. Just removing the buckthorn alone in that park is going to be significant. To Ava's point, it is going to be cheaper to do it now uh, rather than later. Um, it's difficult for staff to make this recommendation, but we do feel that um, from a financial perspective um, and from a natural res resource perspective, it does make sense. It's a unique opportunity. Um, sorry. I would also then echo what Julie said. Um, you know, if budget constraints become an issue and or we start having to go to more of like a two inch tree to can to maintain that one to one ratio specifically because of where new trees are located or uh, the right species of trees and the mix of species of trees that we're doing and we're doing to, you know, much more, uh, I guess, trees closer to sapling age or younger age and those types of things. I think it's imperative that there is a very firm and solid communication plan to not only the residents of the people that live around Arden Park, but also in general in the community. Um, because I think buckthorn and tree removal is gonna be from a, a person that lives on the other side of Highway 100, but drives on 54th quite a bit, it's gonna be eye-opening to see how far you can see into that park all of a sudden. Um, and that's just the perception of what they'll see. So we have to make sure that we are very communicative, both proactively as well as reactively and have answers that are firm and um, you know leave people that have them with a sense of comfort that um, there was solid reasoning behind the choices that we made. So if I could restate mainly as well for Corin's reaction, since it was her original motion where we started this, what I'm hearing is we have a motion to remove all 77 ash trees in the park project area to be replaced with the one for one replacement with the largest size possible to fit park design and budget. Does that fit, Brenda, with what you're trying to say? I agree. Corin, you accept that? All right. I remotion that motion. Okay. Any other discussion? Ava, Brendan, anything else from your side to the table? Is there a second to close discussion? I'll second that. Okay. Then we have a motion in front of us. Does it need to be? I'll restate it again, even though I just did. Remove all 77 ash. I, I lost it up on the screen here, which would have been helpful, but uh, thank you. Remove all 77 <laughs> of the ash trees in the Arden Park project area. Uh, to be replaced in a one-for-one -one basis with the largest size possible to fit park design and budget. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed. So that's our recommendation. And to also reiterate, I also agree a communication plan um, will be a big part of this. And might as well keep start that now, right? Thank you. Good discussion. Appreciate all the inputs. Next up, Braemar Park Master Plan Review. Anne, is that you? Yes, thank you, Greg. I, I actually did not prepare a presentation for you this evening. I oh, Excuse me, Anne. Sorry to interrupt you. Sure. Before, I wanted to thank Luther also for your inputs uh, and advice. We certainly wouldn't be able to make even close to a good decision without it. And secondly, it happens to be very coincidental. But I wanted to start our one-for-one one tree replacement here with a donation. I know it doesn't meet the two and a half inch, uh, but I've been told it's a red oak. I received it at work today and figured it was no better place to have it than to bring it in today and maybe it fits somewhere else, maybe it fits in Arden Park. Happy but Earth Day. You could do that too. I, I knew it wasn't going to end up in my yard, so I figured we could do something better with it. Thanks, Luther. Sorry, Ann. He wants Thanks. a plaque with his name on it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I did not prepare a specific presentation this evening for Braemar Park. I did include as part of your packet materials uh, the master plan that was completed for Braemar Park. 
I can pull it up on the on the screen if it's more helpful uh, this evening if anyone needs to see it that way. Um, the goal of the discussion this evening is to start a conversation uh, as a board about prioritization of any projects uh, for the master plan at Braemar Park. Um, if you recall, when we made the presentation to the city council, I believe it was back in January of this year, the city council asked the Parks and Recreation Commission to prioritize those projects, put a budget uh, to that prioritization, and report back to the city council. Uh, we've been busy with a lot of other projects um, going on, so I apologize for not getting to this sooner this year. Um, but I think in uh, May, if not yet in uh, later April, we will be able to, um, as a community of, a community of the Parks and Recreation Commission, uh, begin to work on this project. So Greg and I were talking, and we thought it might be nice to have a conversation as a commission uh, to get any feelings that the entire commission has about prioritization before we work as a smaller committee of the commission. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, I'd be happy to pull up the present or the uh, the map of the overall park on the screen if you feel that. Why don't that you would do be that? Because that way we're all looking at the same thing. And since, as Ann noted, since this is really um, somewhat of a starting point to get inputs from the commission before we ha we do have a smaller team to then dig into this even further. Uh, my thought would be rather than have a broad discussion on this is maybe just go around after Ann pulls up the, uh, the visual, go around and if you have any immediate reactions or inputs, you know, we'll have uh, time for each commission member to give those and we'll capture them. Uh, and then from there we'll go and do the, the smaller team work. So Brenda, let's start on your side of the dais and okay. any insight there, input that you want to make sure the smaller group would have on this. Um, sure, so the one thing I feel is really important about the plan is to um, make sure the trail system connects the park. Uh, it's been something we've been talking about for years as far as uh, connecting it and making it feel like it's all one area. So I think we want to make sure, I would, I would prioritize that. And the other thing we've been talking about is the natural resource improvements and really make sh making sure that um, Oak Savanna and the Oak Woodland and all the West um, wetland restoration happened. So those are my two um, first things that I feel like if, you know, depending on how the budget goes, that should be prioritized. Okay, thanks. Mike? Bingo. Uh, so yeah, trails, far and away for me, number one, and even within the trail system, I could probably prioritize and say uh, pedestrian, one mountain bike 1a ski a little less of a priority just because we never get snow except for in April uh, and then the uh, natural resources for sure okay Matt um, <clears throat> I think from a prioritization perspective um, you know I like the uh, the, the trails, um, you know, creating the, uh, I guess, an interlocking system throughout the whole park complex. It's uh, an interesting for me as a resident to have never really thought of Braemar holistically in terms of the golf course, the dome, the baseball fields, the, the rinks, and those types of things as a holistic one big parks complex, and it really is. So it's nice to see the trails do that. I guess um, I do have a question about that. It seems... You know, we had a conversation a couple of months ago about the um, lighting that's going in, and that's was proposed as part of this overall project. And then I think last week in the Sun Current, they talked about the trail system, and it feels like from that um, article that those are already kind of moving forward. So, is this project a little bit more piecemeal, um, or is it one holistic? pot of money and budget that we're pulling from? So that would be a question I would have around the trail system, and then. The other thing for me is, is and I think Brenda touched on it, is the reclamation of the um, the old golf course and how that's being used. And um, I think I've made it myself perfectly clear in this um, uh, council room before about what I think should be that some of the land should be used for. But um, I'm hoping that some other op other options can be looked at along with the the biking trails and the hiking trails and the snowshoeing trails in the winter. So. Okay. Thanks, Rick. 
I think the trails certainly are important. One question I had was about buckthorn is that has been an issue certainly on the golf course. Very poor. Is that going to be able to be controlled or throughout the whole area? It's a really great question, Rick, and I think it's really important that, um, you know, as we talked about the same thing in Arden Park, it's really important that we don't bite off more than we can chew and we don't bite off more than we can afford to maintain in the future. So it's going to be really important that we do it um, in a very smart and a very planned fashion because it is expensive to remove and it's expensive to maintain it and it's important. Otherwise, if we don't maintain it, it will just come right back. Also, I had a question about uh, facilities. You know, like, so if we entertain cross country skiing and walking in the wintertime, um, what type of facilities are we gonna plan for? Okay, thanks Rick. Julie? So I agree with the trails recommendation. I think even within trails though, there's some prioritization that can happen with the, you know, sort of the large loop and we've tried to prioritize that. Um, in our park plans. Um, you know, we have the mountain biking trails in various places. Um, you know, I think that depending on the availability of funds and resources, you know, there might be the opportunity to do a chunk of those on either the east or the west side um, and prioritize those. But I, I do think looking at the trails, you know, we have stated that one of our goals is to create large walking loops, um, multi-use loops. And there's a real great opportunity for that here. So I would start with that and then look at some of the other offshoot, smaller loops that we've talked about. Okay, thanks. Pat? Yep, the trails uh, as well as the mountain biking trail. That's my recommendation. Okay, Corin? I wish I had something that wasn't already said. That's a big priority. So I'm just gonna kind of echo what you already said, but I think that the trails are really important. I think it's important that they connect through as well as continue to connect to um, sidewalks and trails so they can continue on through biking. It would be great to continue on so it connects over towards like Fred Richards, um, especially if we can get some soccer fields or sport, sporting fields at both locations. Um, I think the great, the more we can make this more bike friendly and um, community friendly, I think the better at, for all ages and all abilities, not just for golfers and for hockey players. Yep. Ava. Um, like everything that I was thinking has already been said, but I'd say that walking trails should be a main priority because we do live in Minnesota and snow is kind of sketchy around here. So I'd say ski trails and like snowshoeing trails should be more on the back burner just based on like our weather conditions so far. Okay, and Brendan? Uh, I, I think the uh, trails, the connectedness, especially with the baseball fields, corny fields are a big good thing. Also, um, I just kind of thought of how Earlier, a couple months ago, we had talked about there are kind of some open-ended parts of the piece, like with the pickleball or platform tennis. That was so. I was just uh, thinking about at what point we would make a more of a decision about that, and especially as more info is going out to the public, when that would be a good time to make a decision about that, because that's something that's really new to the place, so that's probably high on the interest list of the public, okay. in my opinion. Good. Thank you. Um, I, I'm kind of last and don't have much unique to add either. I agree the uh, trail system to connect the park, the idea of the interlocking full park uh, system is, uh, is I think important. I like the way Mike put it. I would say pedestrian is one, but mountain biking is a 1A because that's something we don't have somewhere else in Edina. We certainly have heard from um, parts of our community that they're excited about it and they'd like to see that move along very quickly. So I would make sure that we keep that up there relatively high. Um, the one question mark that comes up for me that I think we'll have to think about or address is when we go through this idea of the full interlocking system for both pedestrian and mountain biking is the boardwalk issues. Um, and I think we had some, some discussion in or at least maybe some open issues about you know, what will we need? Is the current systems okay? Are we gonna have to add anything from a boardwalk perspective, safety from bikes, pedestrians, et cetera? So that would be my only other watch out. Yeah, we could do some ash tree boardwalk. I think that'll be right on the top. Yeah. Sorry, I did have one thing else piggybacking off of what you just said, Greg, which is we talk about uh, increase in pedestrian traffic and bike traffic uh, in our existing uh, car traffic. 
I'd like to see a prioritization around them. Well, it's not a, you know, it's not a pretty solution, but in terms of how the parking lots flow, um, hmm. and, or if there are opportunities for different types of parking, um, I know that it's limited up there. I think um, the student members had talked about how when it's a big hockey game over there, people are parking on the frontage road. We might not be able to solve for that, but I can tell you um, as a parent that is to go over there quite frequently, it's a free for all. And I don't know if that's just a, um, a uh, it just is something that the lot now that the construction kind of there over there has been done, it needs to be restriped or something like that, but it'd be nice to find some traffic controls in that area. Um, especially in front of the rink where there's kind of one way in, one way out from the arena and a lot of people use it as a drop-off area and there's little kids with big bag, hockey bags. And then uh, over by the um, soccer dome or soccer field and, and Courtney Fields, it feels like there could be some uh, traffic coordination to be able to make that a little bit more of an easy flow through and stuff like that um, without that the expense of losing uh, parking spots. Good, thank you. And does that give us enough to move forward with the smaller working group? That's really fantastic. Thanks for all the feedback. Good. Thank you. Okay, next up on our agenda, comprehensive plan update. And uh, I own that one, so I will kick us off. You should have gotten in your packet uh, what I am calling our fifth iteration of our, hopefully will reach us to our final draft. It's not a final final. There'll be more work still done, but uh, our final draft. And if you didn't look at it in a color-coded mode, you may have missed the, all the highlighted updates. But that's what I'm going to walk through first so that we're kind of aware of what we've got. So in the draft that was part of the packet, uh, we did have inputs from a couple other commissions. And I'd also added some inputs that uh, Brenda had given before our last or right at the timing of our last meeting and from the inputs from our meeting in March. And those are all captured in the document in red just so you could begin to see where we were making some changes. Um, so those are new items, new content. But I wanted us at least to spend some, a little bit of time eventually on the orange items. And they were some things that had come up from a couple different areas for some discussion uh, where I believe we'll need some input just to decide, does it stay, does it go, do we uh, adjust it any? But before we get to that, I wanted to just see from your opportunity to review this fifth iteration of the document, any other inputs or items that we should be addressing that may be missing that you have seen and getting another chance to take a look at it. And then uh, you can certainly pick up on one of those items that I mentioned in red or orange. And if we don't cover those, then I'll circle back and make sure we get a look at each of those. So, Hey, Greg, I just had a question for yep. you. because. Um, I thought I saw a couple emails going back and forth about um, the finance section yep. and whether or not that was supposed to be in here or not. So I didn't know what the resolution, like on some of the um, things where we were we wanted to approve the budgets. Or, well, there or wasn't. Like it that. wasn't. So, uh, yeah. so what what Brenda is picking up on is on page nine of the document. It does come under finance and uh, management. Um, point G. Uh, we had had some verbiage in here around, uh, and I'll just read it, uh, to ensure transparency, accountability, and sustainability of Edina assets. Enterprise facilities will, be, will, review, will renew long-term business plans every third year for presentation to the park and approval by the Edina City Council. Annual reviews of performance against plan will be conducted by the uh, Park and Rec Department staff and a small park working group appropriate with the end of each enterprise facility season. So that's not really clear necessarily on finance versus operating um, or just from more of a marketing and strategic perspective. So that could need some clarity. But where we did get some feedback was around the two points that I'll share. One was um, the, the enterprise facility plans and uh, performance is reviewed by broader staff, correct? Not even by the city council, but it's done within, the, within city staff. And then second, from a commission perspective, uh, it was discussed six to eight years ago around what kind of oversight commissions should have and was determined at that time it's not financial oversight. So that's not something that we're being asked to do. So those were the two inputs that were Okay, so we specifically that. around this, that we could have some discussion to say, how should it change this? Does it, does it impact it enough that we just say, we shouldn't even worry about putting that in here and don't do it at all? 
or do we think it still has some validity and it might need to be changed and amended? Okay, great. I just, yeah, good, so. Okay. So still a point open for discussion and we can get back to that or we can discuss it now, but if others have other inputs that they want to raise as well, we'll make sure we cover them all. Anything else? All right, well, let's just, let's just go on that one then. Since I just read that, what's the, what's the reaction from the commission on, uh, on that point G within finance and management? Is that something that is meaningful and we should have in a comprehensive plan? Uh, is that something we should just drop all together because it feels like it's outside of our purview of what we're being asked to do from a responsibility perspective? Yeah, I appreciate some inputs from others on the commission. Well, I think there's two aspects to finance. There's planning and there's review. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can accept we don't have financial responsibility. And so probably the review aspect of it maybe wouldn't fall under our purview. But I, I would think that the planning aspect of it uh, certainly would. And I think it's uh, definitely within our purview if, you know, the Dyna or Braemar Ice Arena wanted to become a roller rink or something. I mean, it's, uh, uh, these, are, these are their financial plans going forward and how they're going to be implementing programs to stay profitable. So I would think that that would be within our purview. I think it helps uh, piggybacking on that. I think it helps formulate a little bit of some of the recommendations that we make <clears throat> i think we get some of i think we get a little bit of the i'll call it behind the curtain view in some instances so you know annually we go through and we see the proposed fees for all the different activities or uh, memberships to the swimming pool those types of things and we also see budgets and stuff like that as as projects come due um i i think i echo what member miller said in terms of it'd be nice to have at least some of us be a part of a, just a review, not, um, it's not as necessarily us giving feedback, but just a review so that we can, as a holistic unit, kind of be able to use that financial backbone to really kind of help formulate a little bit of our recommendations um, going forward. And I think for me personally, I think it's what would be helpful, um, especially as we start looking at um, larger projects and ideas that I think we've kicked around in here before, um, you know, just give us a little bit more of a firm footing instead of just kind of maybe guessing a little bit because, um, you know, as an example, just the, the discussion around Arden Park, you know, where are we at financially? Where would be other dollars that we would pull to, to spend if we needed to find other budgetary dollars to pay for trees or those types of things? It just give us a little bit more of a, uh, understand, uh, just a, a little bit deeper understanding of the budget and things like that, especially now this year was we're coming into a CIP year. So Greg, just a quick question. So does the um, city council look at these plans every third year or did you say they, they don't? Because it, here it says hmm, they do or do they? And can you? Well, it depends upon what you mean by business plans. We haven't done formal business plans in the last few years. Um, as I was mentioning to Greg earlier today, um, there is very detailed financial reviews of all of our enterprise operations from staff, Susan and myself, uh, from three different members of the finance team, our assistant city manager and our city manager. Um, so those are reviewed a minimum of quarterly, if not monthly. So my question really is, does it seem reasonable that every th this, this kind of requires a um, long-term business plan every three years? I just don't know if that's in the cadence that you could normally have, or is that um, reasonable? To me, it would be unusual to put something like that in a comprehensive plan. Um, you know, it would be more of an administrative decision um, that I would expect direction from our city manager to, uh, to provide for us um, in terms of what he would like to see uh, from a budget and CIP and annual financial and business planning. Great. 
So that would be the question is the timing. It kind of locks us into something that might not actually sync up with what the city does. Well, and just maybe to clarify in what you just said, is it a timing or is it more the topic itself when you say it would be unusual to have it in a comprehensive plan? Yes. Possibly both. Yep. Um, yes, I would say both. But that's just my opinion, and this is the first time I'm doing a comprehensive plan, too. Yep. So, um, so I don't know. But it seems a little bit um, detailed to have a number of years for something like that. On the other hand, though, it seems in a comprehensive plan that if you're not doing business planning, that seems odd also, you know, to, to, to just not be doing it for a number of years seems odd, especially for these large enterprises. I wouldn't say that we're not doing business planning. We are not doing formal business plan books, um, which we did do a couple of years ago. So I think it's very safe to say that we are doing all aspects of business plans. We're just not putting together a business plan book, which I would anticipate um, is what is being stated in this document. Mm -hmm. But I think it is very safe to say that we're doing all the aspects of a business plan in a variety of different modes uh, throughout our city processes. Because it's a little hard to comment because I, you know, we don't, we're not exposed to what you guys are doing and what you're seeing, so. Uh, and I guess I would comment that I think that's been a common frustration that we've come back to, which is that we have these projects and these enterprise facilities that we're asked to comment on, but we as the commission are not responsible for the budgeting around that and the finances. And I understand that that is, I think, we've come back to it several times as a frustration, but it is not within our purview is my understanding. And so that's, I think, a, a tension that we've just had to live with as a commission that we are we are, we're not given the tools in many cases to fully comment on it, and we're not being asked to, in many cases, comment on the, the finance and budgeting. And so that's where I can see also this piece where we're directing staff to do work that may not be what the council wants us to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, might be a reason for the pushback too. So, but it's, it's a frustration we've all identified, um, but it is the reality we are working with here in the commission, I think. Okay. Any other inputs on this particular item? Otherwise, my recommendation would be, Ann, why don't you and I take it offline and have a discussion about it and see, maybe we get some other inputs to see, does it fit? Does it fit with different wording? Does it not fit at all? And then we'll decide whether we drop it out of the draft. That sounds great. Thank okay. you. Yep. Uh, Greg, I had a question about the Wi-Fi connectivity. Yes. Um, is that in accordance to an overarching city evaluation of Wi-Fi connectivity, uh, or is this specific to connectivity? Is this something that's just going to be available in the parks, or what is a, is there a little bit more color behind that? The, the initial insight, as I recall, when it was suggested was uh, perhaps not directly tied to where the city was going, although it could be, but I think it was more just thinking about enhancing the parks from a brand and connectivity perspective. Um, and then Brenda had added some good insight as well as saying, should it be all parks and enterprise facilities or should we change that wording to be select parks and enterprise facilities from a cost perspective? But it was originally brought up as something from improving the kind of brand and um, call it usability, if you would, aspect of our parks and enterprise facilities, not necessarily driven from a city directive down. And there also some discussion just about openness and accessibility to everybody. That would tie back into this? Yeah, I just thought, I thought I recall just talking about, you know, accessibility to everybody that comes to our parks has accessibility to Wi-Fi, you know, versus, sorry, only Richie Dunn and people get Wi-Fi and you guys, everybody else is cut out and go find it somewhere else. I, I, I don't remember maybe that. I didn't, but maybe I didn't recall yeah. that correctly. So why would somebody who wasn't from Edina not build these Wi-Fi at one of our parks? 
No, they would. They oh, were saying okay. that we would provide Wi-Fi so that everybody oh, would have accessibility. Oh. Yep. Uh, if, just if as part available. of right. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. as kind of part of Edina, not really the park, but Edina. Oh, got it. Was, got it. Yeah. But that was the one wording change that was suggested in here, is we would change this to say evaluating Wi-Fi connectivity for select parks and enterprise facilities, just from a potential cost perspective. Yeah, I guess my only feedback then would be, and maybe this is in here and I'm just missing it, um, which could be the case, but to find out if there is a city Wi-Fi, some sort of connectivity plan, similar to what yep. I know that they went through in Minneapolis a few years ago, and if so, how do we tie into that? Yep. Um, so we're not just kind of out on a limb doing it on our own. Okay. Um, page eight. Uh, page eight, under again, still finance and management, section B. Uh, we'd had a lot of inputs and some discussion around how we expand um, how we expand f access to additional athletic uh, fields and even some enterprise facilities that are outside of Edina. Uh, and so one of the things that was from the 2008 that was carried over now into 2018, the action item, as it was stated here, was explore partnerships within five miles of Edina that would offer access to additional outdoor athletic fields. Um, so again, it was somewhat in the vein of a number of us as our kids grew up were off to the dome at Holy Angels or somewhere else because that's the only place that we could get field space indoors in the winter. Um, and so that was tying to that and something that was being kept but amended from 2008 uh, and then a question had come up on both sides around the issue of, well, what does five miles mean? Should it, should everything always be inside Edina? Are we comfortable with, with uh, kind of a directive to look outside of Edina? And if we are, should it really be within five miles or should it be further than five miles? My only question on that would be um, our role versus the different, and Pat, you can chime in here too, is our role versus the different um, sporting organization roles so for example like the soccer association or soccer club they are looking at different opportunities themselves when when we say sorry we don't have enough space they're looking at other opportunities so is it is the onus on us to look for those opportunities outside of our city or is it those people who need more space and we have started kind of turn the turn them away so we don't have any more space to give you is it onus on them to find that space or is it up, up to us and if it is up to us, how are we going about that? And if that's, maybe that's, um, her name is escaping me, I got, the gal on your team, maybe that's her role of doing it, but I don't know. Is that, some, it, it's, it's never been something on our, Tiffany, thank you, it's never been something that I feel like we've ever talked about. So I'm just curious if that's something that we should have in our packet. So um, I wasn't the director here in 2008, um, but I have seen, reference to a five mile radius, you know, looking for athletic field opportunities. And I believe that this reference was prior to us building a dome. Um, you know, there were conversations for 10 years about not being able to find a site for a dome in Edina. And so the thought was, let's look outside of Edina to consider partnerships or consider maybe even purchasing some land outside of Edina to build a dome. Um, so I believe that that's where this five mile radius conversation happened. Um, we do have a dome now. Uh, we found a site inside Edina, obviously, in which to build it. Um, all of our athletic field needs um, are still currently not being met. So I guess the question that I would have back to the commission is, do you feel that we still want to be pursuing potential athletic field space outside of Edina, whether it's city staff or whether it's the athletic associations. Typically, it is it is our athletic associations that are yeah. searching for time I do, I do know that the, uh, my husband's on the board for the Edina Soccer Club, so I do know that they are pursuing those different things themselves. So I, and I, just because I'm aware of that, and if that's the case, then should it, and if it's really should be on us, then should we be doing it? Or are we, or do we have two different organizations doing the same thing? And if that's not needed, then I think that we should come together and say, you know, we've given you, we, we only have this much space. Unfortunately, we don't have enough for you. 
you guys could find your own fields if we happen to miraculously able to get some more fields then we can be able to you know grant those wishes for you but i think that that's where i think there's some clarity that may be helping because i would hate for us to be doing two different groups doing the same thing because that just, just seems like double work that would be my only feedback i think it's kind of self-evident doesn't it if you need space you gotta go look for it yeah i think i'll just use this as an example so over across 169 is a place called champions hall um it might be a situation just entertain me with this where we as a park board are able to park commission are able to open the negotiations with them and we're able to secure a block of time that we can then take to set associations that may be looking for space it's large field space and let them do it i i understand it's not the perfect example because probably the soccer club and the lacrosse uh, the lacrosse association and those people are talking to those to that facility but as an example if we know we need 20 hours uh, over the course of the month of June of field space, we can go and get 20 hours across all the associations. We can use it as an opportunity to negotiate in bulk and then go and provide that and then let them kind of, similar to what we do, I think, with the dome, which is each one of the associations is required to spend a certain amount of hours or dedicate a certain amount of their hours there. And then they go and they kind of, they slot it however they see fit with whatever teams they are. So I think there is a, there is a, there is a role for us there. Um, but at the same time, to what Corn and Mike are saying too, I mean, the associations know exactly what they need and where their underage is in terms of ice time or field time or whatever, and they're going and finding it too. So um, I think there is a role that we could play, um, at least from a facilitator perspective. And I guess that's kind of the way I read this as well, although Corn, you bring up a good point that someone could look at this and say, well, look, the city says they're gonna do that. So. It's your responsibility to go get it and give it to us. That clearly isn't what's been happening the last 10 or 15 years. And I, I think I would build off of what Matt's saying is potentially what this says is, should we at least take on that, maybe responsibility is too strong a word, but an action to say we should be out working in partnership with our athletic associations, because maybe we can leverage it somehow. Yeah, I would venture to bet that, uh, as an example, the baseball association is probably not talking to the football association. Um, they just know that they have field space that they can both use at the dome. But when they're looking elsewhere, they're probably the football association, the hot baseball, so just looking for their own self. And so if we can, if they come to us and say, we need five more hours, the football says, I need eight more hours, we can try and help facilitate. I think that that might be more of the, where the wording is, is to maybe be... Uh, uh, play the role of facilitator in the uh, exploration of partner. I don't know how that, I'm not a mm -hmm. wordsmith, but something to that effect that plaz were more of a liaison, if that's the right word for. But, but is it really our role or is it Tiffany's role? Yeah, that's... I mean, I feel like that's a Tiffany's job versus the park boards. Yeah, oh. yeah I don't, sorry, go I ahead. I mean, typically, Pat. so I run the Girls Fast Pitch Association and if we don't have space, we look to other avenues and it's really just up to the association you know there's a basically the way that it works is it's um you know for example you brought up the football and and the dome and it's kind of who was the ones that initially um pitched in to to uh you know procure the dome and those are the ones and the ones that continue to pay every year to basically have priority and that's kind of how it works with all the different fields as well. So it's it's not really, I mean, they have a system. It's a good system and it works. And I don't think that's our responsibility. Rick, were you gonna add something else? Yeah, I just think that we should let staff take that first crack at it, uh, you know, in terms of the associations. And, um, you know, if we take that on, it's just, uh, not that we wouldn't do a good job, but I think just letting staff uh, have first uh, first crack at it. So then we build off of that point right. and, and some of the, I think what Corin was saying, I don't see this as a document that's instructing this commission. Okay. This is a document that's instructing staff and this commission working together and saying, this is where we're headed as a park and rec department, not just commission work. And Ann, would you see the same? I know you said this is your first comp plan. 
clearly it's mine as well. Yeah, no, I would agree. Overall vision uh, to be completed by anyone for the So this just opens it up to say then as a team working together, we're thinking about how do we get that done? Is it staff work? Is it where we could get an objection to this is if we wanted to say, we don't even think this should be staff work. We should just leave it up to the athletic communities and their commissions themselves and just have at it. You see there is a need, go do it. But we, as the broader Edina Park and Rec group, we don't see that as something that we should get involved in. And I guess the way I understood it when I read it initially is, you know, we've identified gaps, like you identified the gap with the dome, right? We have gaps with, you know, snow tubing or like um, cross country skiing. And there's, we don't have those facilities in Edina. And so are there places where we can partner with the neighboring right. community? Um, but I, I guess I didn't read it as a, we have, you know, we have rink space, we have field space. If um, an association is looking for additional space that's not provided by us, um, that we would be doing a survey of the surrounding communities about time and finding that space. I, I read it more of a strategic partnership, particularly we, we have identified gaps. And I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm trying to envision how it would be the park board's responsibility to, or the, the park um, department's responsibility to be doing a survey of sort of availability of time and fields and other communities. I mean, I think make, identifying known gaps and partnerships for known gaps makes sense, but the way it's being talked about now, it seems broader than what it would make yep. sense for us to be doing. So would anyone have a strong passion if we dropped this against that? Say, no, we really think this is something we should have in here. We think it's something we should be facilitating and leveraging over the next 10 years. I don't think it's needed personally. I, I don't know if it's needed. I just, I think we have to caveat by saying that the associations are all do, out there doing their own work mm-hmm. and doing their due diligence to find space because we all, I think, are in agreement that we're short of space. So you can expect that those same folks are going to come back to this board and or the park department with their concerns and their issues um, as it pertains. And, you know, we've had a couple of associations that have provided us their own field um, usage study or analysis, if you want to call it that. Um, they're going to come back to us. So when they're able to find stuff, they're out doing that on their own. But when they don't, when they run up against the 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 barrier of that they can't fix anything or they can't find the stuff, they're going to come to us. So we better be prepared for those conversations as well. Um, Rick, did you have one more? Right. We could soften that a little bit and say, you know, something like when the opportunity pre- presents sure. itself, mm-hmm. you know, then that doesn't leave us entirely out. Yep. But this is kind of definitive and right. will be. Right. I, I for sure agree with everyone saying that we shouldn't take the lead on this. Um, and I don't know if Tiffany or any of the staff should be the lead person on this. I just, I think we need to be aware of the field shortage. And I think that when needed, we can engage with an aid in the, however you want to exactly how Rick kind of stated it. So let me suggest I'll drop the action item that we have here and try to change the wording to, to address something more to that extent. And then it's more reactive and working in in concert with, uh, with the community athletic associations that are already driving that as opposed to saying we're going to take this on ourselves. And we can take a look at that at our sixth or seventh iteration of the draft. You'll run out of color options. I know it. Okay. Last thing I had to, uh, to update and get some insight. One of the core metrics and policies and metrics that we've had and carried over from last year is, or excuse me, the last comprehensive report is on page four, section C. And it's kind of the core one under parks, open spaces, and trails, uh, point A. Devote a minimum of 15% of Edina's land area to parkland and open space. And, And most of the insight and input that I've got from people has said, yes, we need to keep that, yes, we need to keep that, yes, we need to keep that. So I just did a little work to say, well, where are we today? And today we're right at that 15% from a perspective of, of looking at, um, <laughs> at uh, Edina's land area to parkland to park space. And I think that's using 
the number we have in here is a uh, 1,550 acres of park space, uh, and Edina being, uh, I think it was uh, 16, 16 square miles. So we're right at that number. I don't know if that was intentional or if that's just kind of the way it's, it's developed and we're there. I think most of us would say, well, Edina itself is not likely to be changing in size any. And we get pretty well developed, so we have very few places to increase our park land space and open space, except as we maybe put lids on highways and put parks on top of those lids. So I then asked myself the question, is this a very meaningful metric for us? Is there a different way that we should be looking at how do we provide parkland capacity as we grow? Right? We see condos and, uh, and other types of buildings that are being proposed, and now we're growing up rather than uh, filling the space that we have. Um, so I just wanted to open that up for other, any other insight as well. I did look at a couple other metrics that were out there. Uh, a couple that are being used are things like um, um, acres per 1,000 residents um, or number of parks per residence. Uh, and so just wanted to see if anyone had any initial reaction to whether we should be looking at a different metric. And Ann would open that up to you and anyone else in the staff. If that's something you've looked at and considered before, is there a different way that we measure that we have an adequate amount of park uh, and open space for the community as a whole? Reactions, inputs? It's kind of a core metric that we've had, a core statement in my, metric. My initial reaction is, you know, we wouldn't want to go below that 15%. So I, I like having something in there that says, you know, you can't take parkland away. Yep. So I don't know how we do that. Um, and I like the part about matching, you know, if you have increased commercial growth with the new parks. Um, so I, I do think we need to keep something in there that doesn't allow us to reduce what we currently have, I, but I don't know what the best metric would be. Yeah. And, and I agree with that, and I guess where I challenge myself is then to say as our community continues to grow, uh, it's not going to grow by space. It could grow by population. It could grow by other activities that are happening. Is that still a meaningful metric, right? It's kind of like we say, well, we've already achieved it and it's probably not going to change unless we start selling a lot of parkland, and this would tell us we shouldn't do that. But how else do we then measure? Are we being proactive and thinking about five years, seven years, ten years from now, what's, uh, what's our population likely to be if we have a number of 15 or 17-story condos around the Southdale area or Grandview, and how are we addressing the different needs for park and open spaces? Yeah, so it kind of seems, seems like that action point needs to have some sort of metric with it, right? Like match and increased density of residential growth with the creation of new parks. There isn't anything that really yep. tells you what that is, right? And do we ever look at buying additional land if we, if we can, just hypothetically, if we continue to grow and we keep increasing our people, but we can't increase our land, is, do we ever look at, you know, Every house that goes in the market before the builders buy them, you know, is there ever? Do we ever look at the, that land that could be adjacent that we could use that as? I'm just curious, or you know, other. I don't know that, any other way you could grow land. So I just was curious if that's ever something that we look at or. Sure, absolutely. If there's an opportunity, we would definitely consider it. I mean, we recently purchased a piece of property from the city of Minneapolis on the northeast corner of town. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, definitely. Um, it, you know, it would have to be a parcel that would be significant enough for it to be um, realistic for us to be able to do something with. Um, I, I think the other point is, as we're redoing different commercial developments, is there an opportunity to include park space as part of those developments? Um, whether it's a parkland as part of a private development or parkland that the city gets in lieu of uh, that development uh, is certainly something that we consider as well. What do you consider Edinburgh Park? Um, in terms of... Green space or park? Or, I mean, uh, that, it would be both. Calculation? Actually, we have, um, we have an acre indoors and an acre outdoors of green space at Edinburgh Park. 
So they would look at the total acreage of the footprint of that park. So that's, uh, I mean, could be the future more than we like. It, you know, it's development with some type of recreation or green space in it. I don't know if we're getting to any answers though for you on the specific uh well we can we can potentially just keep it open for, for for some further thoughts some of the things that i did look at and this came from uh national recreation and park association and they had a, a performance review and key findings and a few metrics that i tried to compare to us just as a a point of reference uh, one they had was acres of parkland per 1000 residents and in their 2018 key findings, that number was 10.1. 10.1 acres of parkland per 1,000 residents. And as of Edina's 51,350 2016 population, we're at about 30 acres per 1,000 residents. So we're 3x that number, at least today. So it could be another way of looking at it. Second was they had residents per park, 2,114 residents per park. Uh, and I think, again, using these same numbers in about 43 parks and green spaces in Edina, we are 1,194 residents per park. Um, so, and then the other one, and Ann, you'd have to help with this, uh, operating expenditures. And if that's, an, uh, if that's a reflection of kind of upkeep, and again, you could look at that one way or the other. Is that upkeep and maintaining or is that gee it's just really expensive to take care of their parks but it was a uh, 78 dollars call it 78 dollars per capita per year which again based on edina's population would put us at a little bit over four million dollars a year and did you say last month we were three and a half or something do i remember that correctly or not three and a half uh, a budget Operating for kind of maintaining parks oh. and yeah we're about that for our park maintenance budget yep a little bit over three and a half million dollars okay. actually yes um yeah there are a lot of really great metrics in the nrpa another is walking distance yep. uh how, you know how many blocks to a park um, is another really great metric. So we could certainly review some of those metrics um, from the NRPA and incorporate some of them as part of this. And, and to your point, we do have embedded in here, I think it's the desire to be, for all residents to be within one mile walking distance of a park. Yep. So we do kind of have that embedded in here as well. Great. Okay. Any other inputs? So that's fifth iteration plan now is to go in front of the Planning Commission. And are we on tomorrow? Is that right? Yep. Okay. I had something on my calendar on that, so I just wanted to make sure I was going to be there. <laughs> Thank you again for your inputs and insight on it. Uh, I don't think we have any other need to do anything else with that, but just wanted to let you know where we were. All right. Uh, next up, uh, City Council updates, Chair and Member comments. So any, uh, any comments across the uh, members? Rick. I have one. Uh, last Wednesday, um, I attended uh, the first Braemar Golf Association meeting for 2018. And Joe Abood, the general manager, certainly um, uh, presented the financial results for the fiscal period. Uh, and I can tell you that the Driving Range Academy, this is year over year, uh, was up 47% mm. in revenue. That's, uh, that equates to 218,000 more in revenue. And the golf dome was up 9% or about 27,000. So I just, uh, I think we are certainly want to take the opportunity to t uh, thank the park and rec staff, in particular Ann and Sue for the hard work in uh, making this possible. Despite not having a golf course open. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, great, excellent. Thanks, Rick. Others? Hey, Greg, I just wanted to thank you for all the work that you did on this comprehensive plan. That was just, just excellent um, coordination, and I, you can't believe how much time he's put into this. So, thank you very much. It, it was a huge, <laughs> a huge project for us, and I, th I think we ended up in a really good place. So, good. Thank you. Others. 
I was just going to ask really quick. I just was looking at the um, updates, and I wasn't aware of what was going on at Sherwood Park. So I was just curious what that um, approved access agreement with construction on um, Sherwood Park was. There is a siding project um, that is happening with the uh, condo units that are immediately adjacent to the park. And I think they're doing stucco work, actually. And um, they requested access through the backside of their buildings along the edge of Sherwood Park uh, to be able to get access for their materials and their scaffolding to, um, to re-stucco their building. So we provided an access agreement. They have to restore the property. Uh, they put a damage deposit down. And uh, when the park is restored to our satisfaction, then they get their damage deposit back. And we do tie that also to their building permit. So their building permit cannot be released until we have signed off on the park restoration. And I had only one, and then I'll turn it over to Ann. And Brenda wasn't with us uh, last month when I took over from my first meeting as chair. So now that you are here, a little informal recognition. I just wanted to give you a little pack of cards. They're thank you cards for you to say thank you to you and uh, for your hard work that you did and also helping to prepare me for this role. And it's something that you can use when you thank others, as I'm sure you do often. Yeah, thank you, Greg. That's yeah. very considerate. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks. Thank you. Anne, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. I have a few updates for you. Um, to, uh, to go off of some of the comments that Rick made, uh, we had uh, a really great week at the Dome last week. Uh, while the weather is bad outside, it's good for some of our indoor facilities. Uh, we had our busiest week in the history of the Dome, servicing more than 3,400 customers that hit over 270,000 balls. Um, we're actually running into capacity issues. Uh, we're feeling terrible for all the high school programs in the state. There's just no place for them to go. So uh, Joe has been opening up the dome as early as 6 a.m. to try to get teams in there before the dome even opens uh, with the concern that we might run out of balls by the end of the day. So, so far we haven't, but it's been, uh, but it's been awfully close. So, uh, so the dome is doing very well. Uh, we had our third annual bunny breakfast uh, that was a partnership between the golf course and our parks and recreation team that was very successful a couple weeks ago. We had over 150 kids uh, in attendance. Uh, the next event that we have at the golf course is the Princess Ball on April 20th, and we have a superhero uh, event uh, on April 28th. Uh, the weather hasn't been cooperating very well, but we did start work on uh, restoration of our main slides at the Aquatic Center. Uh, we are resurfacing both the inside and the outside of the slides. Um, the condition of the slides generally is in good shape, um, but they don't look very good and they're starting to not be as slippery as they once were. So we are resurfacing the uh, interior and exterior of the slides and they will be uh, repainted. Uh, there will be an epoxy base coat and a urethane top coat. Uh, so, Susan, did we? Do you know what the colors we picked are? I do. Um, we work closely with our communications department. Um, currently, the slides are two shades of blue. Um, we tried to match the new. Um, play structure um, that we put in last year. So the slides are gonna be in Edina green and then a, I'm gonna say an orangish red. So they'll be bright, um, but they will match the color scheme of the new uh, play structure that we put in last year. Thank you, sorry to put you on the spot on that. But we're excited, I think it's gonna give a great look to, uh, to the slides at the Aquatic Center. Uh, Edinburgh Park, again, another one of our indoor facilities, had uh, an incredibly busy month last month. Typically, March is one of our busiest months anyway, but with the weather being uh, even worse than usual, uh, our attendance was up 10% ahead of last year with a total of 20,274 paid daily admissions, and uh, our concession revenue was also up 10%. Um, 
We are in major hiring mode right now. Our department hires um, annually over 600 part-time and seasonal employees, many of which are first-time uh, jobs for kids. So it's a really big responsibility that we have uh, in our department. We have a really great staff that hires, trains, and supervises these kids. Um, just a couple of uh, different uh, departments, our summer playground program hires over 50. They hire around 53 or 55 um, young people. Our aquatic center hires over 80. And uh, in our park maintenance division, we hire 37 seasonals. So that's just a small uh, sampling of uh, those that we hire. But uh, our staff and our HR department is really, really busy getting these kids, uh, getting the jobs posted, doing the interviews, and uh, all of the onboarding paperwork and training. So busy time for us right now. And that's it. Good, thank you. No last comments, I'll take a motion to close. Motion to adjourn. adjourn, seconded, all in favor? Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>